Hey everybody, welcome back to Terminus, the cats of Extreme Metal Podcasts. I am I am the death metal guy, aka the faceless's heroin dealer. You're gonna need to explain that one in just a second. Um, and I am the black metal guy, aka Dark Chivalric Erection. <laughs> Uh, <laughs> been been there before when I when I'm looking at all my uh, my elf dugins. <laughs> yeah, yeah, <laughs> <Rocky Ibarra. laughs> vampire waifu. Exactly. Um, uh, yeah, no. So the yeah the faceless, you know the the kind of like tech deathcore band or whatever. I, I, I believe the the main guy is a total asshole who is just like impossible to work with, and I believe that he was like a junkie, or maybe still is. I don't know. But I think was, was the was the faceless good? Uh first couple albums are good. Uh, after that, it's just kind of like more of the same. They just repeat themselves. They they go and kind of, they, they were one of the early, um, you know, oh, fucking like Deathcore, but it's in space, you know? So there's like, there's a sweep that sounds weird. I, I think a lot of people, I think a lot of people in that era would agree that where Deathcore belonged was in space. <laughs> yeah, no, um, yeah, it's a, no, but the, the first couple records, um, uh, Akaldama and Planetary Duality are pretty good. I mean, you wouldn't get anything out of it. I can I can tell yeah, you yeah. that without question. <laughs> but um, for if you like, you know, polished, techy death metal leaning into deathcore, yeah, it's it's pretty solid. Mm-hmm. It was uh, you know, it's it's what the uh, the kids with gauged ears practiced on before they could start listening to Origin. <laughs> I did like Origin pretty well. Like, never listened to it, but I was like, I approve of this. Origin's good. I mean, yeah. it, it's definitely, it's kind of the same album over and over again, but it's a really good album. I mean, yeah. it's it's very fast. I can say that. <laughs> so. All right, so what what other updates do we have for people? I guess I should say um, February continues stretching on into March. Our schedule uh, is... Our schedule is torn and tattered, but unbowed. Um, <laughs> uh, I was going to... Uh, the death metal guy's travel plans got fucked up by nefarious forces beyond his control. Uh, I was going... <laughs> Silver Airways. <laughs> it's, that's it. <laughs> yes. I, I was going to record a uh, a neo-folk special over the weekend, and uh, I was too depressed to actually do it however i have most of the notes done and i'll be putting that out anyway in the next you know i don't know in the next week just as long as just have to time it so it doesn't like bump up into the next episode <laughs> I, th- I think they'll just appreciate the bonus content also gotta do the zinger well don't worry man i'd be depressed if i had to do a neofolk episode too <laughs> <Ooh>. <laughs> got him <laughs> i can't there's no comeback from that <laughs> <laughs> but uh, uh yeah guys thanks for bearing with us uh like uh, he was saying i i went out of town to visit family this past weekend and my uh, flight got substantially delayed so uh, i was not able to record the night that i got back at uh you know three in the morning um but we are back and we are back with a big episode a big important one for uh all of our uh, all of our listeners and a lot of our friends uh in the terminus co prosperity sphere um would black metal guy would you say this is the single longest haired episode we've ever done on the show <laughs> Yeah, um, and and I'm sure completely coincidentally, it's also the longest my hair has ever been, at least since high school. Oh, there we go. You'll, you'll have to join the Terminus Only fans if you want to see shots of <laughs> that and other growth. Um, yeah, I'll be I'll be windmill headbanging, but not just with my hair. Ooh, I can't wait. <laughs> I was talking. To, I was talking on the Discord to uh, some of our guys about. Uh, do you remember back in '07, Fal Lucifer, the Immoral Code, the black metal themed porno? No. Yeah. So that was that was a production that happened back in '07, and uh, yeah, it it came out, and I, I remember when it came out, a bunch of people bought it, but uh, the the whole thing is now available on all the porn streaming sites, and I took a look at it. 
Uh, oh. Uh, it's it's miserable, unsurprisingly. But uh, I, I always liked how they said, you know, the, the, the male performer is a, a prominent black metal musician who will uh, remain anonymous. And it's, so it was Frost, right? No, it was just clearly one of the guitarists from Enthroned because he, d- he doesn't have that many tattoos and it's very easy to match him up to live photos. <laughs> <laughs> the guitarist of Enthroned, far out. I- Oh, if anyone's going to do a porno, it's like, it's about that level of black No, 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 I think it would be Frost, man. Like, he'd be like, hell yeah, a porno, this is cool and sexy. Or, or like, sadder. He, he yeah, exactly. One, it'd be both members of Satyricon, and they would, dem- <laughs> they would demand to be naked at the same time in the same room. Oh, absolutely. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> they were, if it's not they were, a Satyricon gangbang, is it even fucking Satyricon? <laughs> they're chubbing up to the Mother North video. That works as their fluffer on set. <laughs> um, okay, so... <laughs> How many times a year do we rip on Satyricon? Oh, a lot, man. This is like three so far this year, and I'm planning to pump those numbers up even yeah, further. I, I think it's becoming a meme, yeah. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Um, so before I get even further distracted and uh, don't actually do an episode and just riff on uh, metalhead comedy for a while, uh, if you guys uh, are enjoying this content and us talking about black metal porno, uh, if you're watching on YouTube, uh, smash that like button, uh, hit subscribe, then hit unsubscribe, and then hit subscribe again. Uh, and feel free to comment with uh, your favorite uh, heavy metal themed pornographic film. Uh, furthermore, if you really want to support us, you can follow us on social media, myself, the death metal guy on Facebook at Terminus Podcast and the black metal guy on Instagram at Terminus Extreme Metal. And for the most powerful and daring among you, you can help support us on Patreon, uh, where $5 and up gets you access to the Terminus Prime bonus episodes, as well as the Terminus Black Circle, our private Discord server, where we had a rousing discussion about the cover art of Goat Moon's newest 7-inch. <laughs> you haven't seen it yet, have you? Oh, God. Hey, all This is Brandon from Cromley, and you're listening to Terminus. <laughs> All right, and we are back with the return of Terminus Heroes, Cromlech, bringing you, after ten long years, their second full-length record, Ascent of Kings, out now on Hessian Firm. So, uh, I think the boys from Cromlech would be sort of proud to know that, uh, this may be the most contentious review in Terminus history. <laughs> their their work has um, their work has occasioned a bitter struggle to the death, which will now commence. Um, <laughs> uh, but yeah, so how do we? Um, I figure like I could start with some background stuff that I figure you could probably agree with mm-hmm. and uh, add to whenever you want, and then roll us towards our our takes or we could just say it up front um let's get um let's get some of the background out of the way just if for anyone who's not yeah. familiar with Cromlech. right so Cromlech is a band that does not want to sit still or rest on their laurels if it is not a challenge they are simply not interested right uh like their chariot driving forefathers of yore what they always want is outward expansion, right? Conquering new territory. Uh, And that's the approach they've taken in their discography. So their last full length, Ave Mortis, came out in 2013. That is a full decade ago. Um, Just the fact that the band has lasted this long with that stable a lineup is a feat, right? Um, What that record was, was an excellent uh, exercise in, epi- you know, what we call epic doom, right? Uh, I talked with the band in our interview, you know, you could also maybe call it extreme heavy metal or something like that, right? Uh, grounded in basically the work of Solstice in the 90s, and before that, Candle Mass would be a couple major reference points. Um, uh, and 
you know, uh, spiritually inspired by the same stuff, and especially Tolkien and uh, the Conan books, right? Um, and taking the Conan books extremely seriously. Uh, and the... Um, yeah, so in a lot of ways, it was their effort to write Solstice's New Dark Age. Something like that. And they did a damn good job of it. That's an awesome record. It wasn't perfect. Um, and maybe a lesser or a less ambitious band would have immediately worked on consolidating. Right? You, you put out... Uh, you know, you, you put out your debut. It's very strong. Genre fans love it. Some of it's a bit wonky. And, A, you work on bringing out the things that make your band unique, ironing out the things that are a little weird, and uh, there you go, right? You have just this this great, great success of a second record. Kromlich wanted to keep moving, right? And so over the next 10 years, they worked to really build out all of the most specific and eccentric features of their own music. Uh, they work to heighten its affinity with extreme metal, absorbing influence from stuff like At The Gates, uh, really just outright death metal and death thrash, um, without abandoning clean vocals. So that's really something that's not been done by many people before. Uh, and at the same time, uh, trying to work on a structural level by making things more and more and more epic, right? Composing on a scale, like, fuck the 10-minute song, right? We want the 15-minute song. This, th th and that's, that's how this record is structured. The, um, uh, the EP they put out in 2017, uh, Iron Guard and the Hammer of Triumph split in 2018, were both basically, like, they're in the same style as this record, but they're shorter songs, and you can see them as basically trial runs for this aesthetic. Uh, the difference being that those are, yeah, a bit shorter and also more kind of raw and unhinged. Uh, so now we have the full length, and they are swinging for the bleachers. How long is the record in total, Death Metal Guy? Uh, it's, it's about 70 minutes. Uh, Ave Mortis was also about 70 that dude, that's I did not remember that about Avi Mortis. That's far out. Yeah, um, it seems like they're they're shooting for that over an hour maximalist thing pretty right. consistently. Right. So this is if you know if yeah. Oh, well, I'll get into some more specifics. So I guess the big thing to say would be like this is clearly them going t to distinguish themselves from their master their artistic master, Rich Walker of Solstice, right? And trying to build out their own style, uh, plant their own flag, and they're shooting for a masterpiece here. Um, and we have different opinions on whether that's been achieved. Yes. And this is this is why I'm waiting in your parking lot with a brick right now. <laughs> Wait, shit. I'm waiting in your parking lot with a brick. Oh, no. <laughs> I guess we're going to have to live each other's lives until our flights. But <laughs> oh, God. <laughs> um, yeah, um, no, we, we, we have strikingly different, strikingly different opinions on this that I, I think if you listen to this show a lot, You'll, you'll understand, but came as a little bit of a surprise to us, just because we were on such opposite sides of the fence this time around. We've, um, we've had some kind of contentious reviews, but honestly, you and I line up in like 95% of what we like about Extreme Metal. Um, and, and often it's one of us thinks something is like pretty damn cool and the other guy hates it. Or, like, one guy loves something and the other guy's like, yeah, that's pretty good. And, you know, we can argue a lot about that because that's who we are. But, <laughs> no. Uh, this is, I mean, should we just sort of, uh, I mean, on the other hand, in the absolute sense, we don't disagree diametrically, right? Mm -hmm. that, Basically, that so, I'll shoot first. Basically... Sure. I think this is a good record. I think it is a very meaningful step towards the masterpiece. I don't think they're there yet. Yeah. Which is a, a fair assessment that um, 
you have plenty of supporting information on, which we'll get into. There's yeah. like nine pages of notes between yes. the two of us for this yes. one review. Yes. Um, I, I guess my opinion would be good in all sorts of ways. The, the more elaborate way of saying is there's a we we disagree. Okay, you you know you go on your second thing. Sorry, I, I no no yeah. it's fine. Uh, yeah. So so basically. What the black metal guy is also trying to say is that he thinks there is a lot of great material here, but he thinks that there are also uh, major flaws. That's what I was going to say. Yeah. Um, in my opinion, I think this is brilliant and this is the masterpiece. And th- this immediately rockets its way to, I-, I can't imagine it being less than maybe like top five or even top three for the year for me. Damn. Yeah. yeah I mean, it's phenomenal. Yeah, so the thing for me is, right, like, I have a very high baseline when it comes to Cromlech, right? Uh, There's a certain level of quality that I think you can take for granted. Uh, And in that sense, I'm comparing Cromlech to themselves, both to the work they've put out, um, you know, to Ave Mortis, say, which I think I do like more than this one, uh, but also to Cromlech as I know them to be and know their potential, right? So you're sort of measuring them against themselves uh, and just being like, you know, uh, giving giving as much feedback I can to people I respect, mm-hmm. right? Um, the, uh, but yeah, so like, how would I get into it? I guess... Should I get into the issues more, or I'll preview them? Well, I'll give a I'll give a little outline of how the album sounds, sort of uh, on a base level. Oh, and yeah! I'll, if you could get to the genre thing, that yeah. would be that would be good. Yeah, yeah. So um, you're more familiar with the Cromlech discography than I am. I've heard some of the older songs, but I don't think I've listened to like Ave Mortis all the way through. Mm-hmm. Um, what what I heard was cool, but it didn't strike me as much as it struck you, which now I understand is because these guys operate on really long time scales and you want to listen to whole records, that sort of thing. Um, and that, that conceit is applied writ large to this record, Ascent of Kings. Um, this is an extremely ambitious sort of prog heavy metal record. Uh, but not in the sense that might immediately come to mind. Uh, This still has a big streak of doom running through it, but I wouldn't primarily call this an epic doom record anymore. I I think they're attempting to free themselves from that tagline. Mm -hmm. So uh, it's definitely present, it's definitely important, but the these songs in this album operate on such a huge scale of not just time, but uh, musical and structural intricacy that it's really hard to wrap your head around on the first second, maybe the first handful of listens. Uh, It takes a long time for this to sort of settle in. I loved it immediately, but I think most people won't. Um, So we have a a sort of prog heavy metal epic here, Uh, but spiritually what I detect is that it's connected to a whole set of bands. Uh, I, 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 th- I think I want to mention these so we can get down. Yeah, to no, I think that's good. Sounds like. Thanks. So I just wrote down a bunch of notes of what kind of bands this was reminding me of, because um, a lot of people are going to immediately go to Candlemass or they're going to go to Manowar, but I think there's deeper cut stuff that makes sense that these guys would be listening to. And in order from like greatest to relative least importance, I got something like this. Uh, Manila Road, which I think is basically inarguable here. Yeah. Uh, Virgin Steel. Uh, For those not familiar, very long-running, epic, heavy metal band that's just extremely idiosyncratic and eccentric in the way they deliver their music. Uh, Sirith Ungol. uh, Early sort of uh, doom meets heavy metal weirdo legends. Uh, Slow Feg, which is uh, a band that I really enjoy. Very strange folky, proggy, sword and planet themed heavy (laughs) metal. Incredible. Uh, Sabotage, which everybody knows, obviously. Uh, Reverend Bizarre, who we've talked about a lot, and it's actually the only Doom band in this list. And last one would be Countess, 
which not a lot of people think weird. about anymore. Uh, very weird sort of blackened heavy metal band with uh, an epic prog leaning. I think a lot of people think of them as Countess's Bathory worship. Uh, that is correct to some extent early on, but they really become more like Manila Road worship, like in the mid mid range of their career. It's a very strange band. I'm not a big fan, but I, I get why people are into it. And I, I wrote those down, and I was thinking to myself, well, what do these bands have in common? Um, and I, I tried to think of this as I do in terms of timelines and you know how old members are that kind of thing. So the guys in Crom like are around our age, maybe a little bit older. Um, and it struck me that all of these cult bands that I was talking about were still heavily discussed in like the mid 2000s in online metal forums, but you don't hear about them much now. Um, also, these bands were all frequently name dropped, but not a lot of people listen to them. Everyone talks about Traveler by Slowfeg, but I guarantee you 50% of those people have never actually listened to the album. Cromlech clearly actually listened to those bands. I, I think some of those bands are now quite big with the, uh, I don't know, what, new wave of traditional heavy metal or whatever it is. Yeah, I could see some, that. Yeah. Manila Road in particular and Sirith Ungol are now canon for both like good revivalist heavy metal acts and the ones that uh, Cromlech would describe as weakling posers. Yeah, yeah, um, no, I agree. Uh, I mean, that's a uh, relatively recent wave. I, yeah, that... and you could argue about whether those guys actually capture the things that are most eccentric and difficult and period specific about those bands, and I think that's what interests you. And I, as soon as you made that comparison with Cromlech, it just it, it makes sense, right? I don't know any of these bands well, except for, you know, Crystal Logic by Manila Road. Mm -hmm. But um, it makes sense. And it seems they've done, you know, they've done a smart thing by trying to go, you know, to, to right? How do you how do you get past the, the band that's formative for you, right? You go before them, mm -hmm. right? Yeah. So, um, and, so, so in that sense, it's, it's a smart move. Yeah, yeah. So I, I think these guys want to pull specifically from a deeper set of influences than most of their contemporaries were. And then the last thing that I want to point out about these bands is um, all of them you would have to describe in this sort of tortured way as like a prog heavy metal bands. And then all these bands, even though these are from all different periods, they're all spiritually connected to like 70s prog and psych rock. Mm -hmm. um, and, and like freak folk stuff and, yeah. you know, a, a strange range of sixties through seventies music. Um, and I think those influences and those ideas really inform what Ascent of Kings is after, which is very weird, very bespoke sort of song structures delivered on a scale that is very deliberately challenging to the listener. And I, I think that's where I get to about the end of the things that, like, we can both pretty much agree on <laughs> in terms of yeah. the presentation. Well, well, there's one more thing that I'm that I missed up front that I think you should say to people I about how the record is structured. Oh, OK. So, yeah. So I had this theory while listening to it, uh, given the length, given the length of this record and the length of individual tracks and how ambitious it is. It's really hard to listen to this all in one sitting. But then I started looking at uh, the track listing and the track times, and I believe this is designed to be formatted as a double LP. So you would have, uh, this is a six-track album, so you'd have the first track on the first side, the next two on the second side. You would switch to the new LP, um, two tracks on the third side, one track, the final epic on the fourth side. So I think this is ideally broken up a little bit by little intermissions. I tried that myself, and uh, it, it's much easier to absorb just because these songs are so dense and involved. You want to let your brain reset a little bit before you start tackling another chunk of them. And, and, and I know that you and, ended up trying that. What, what did you think that no, did? I, 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 dude, I actually didn't. Um, oh, you didn't? Oh. I, I, didn't I, like, I, I didn't get around to it. I really want to do it. I will do it over the course of this year, right? This is clearly a record that's going to deserve some more reflection. Mm -hmm. uh, and I'll do it over the course of this year, and we'll see what how it affects the year-end list, right? Yeah, um, but that did occur to me. And, I mean, this could just be coincidental, but with guys like this, they probably yeah. thought that through. Yeah, so the other thing is, I mean, I... 
you know, I think one reason I didn't go back and do it is that personally, I simply don't like it that much. Right? <laughs> um, and that's because of certain things. And I think part of that is subjective, right? If you make a sprawling prog metal album based on Sirith Ungol, that's going to be just a a generic hurdle for me that that's, I'm not that's, sure I can leave. That's leap. a tough pill for you to swallow in general. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Basically, this deliberately crosses a lot of things I consider the, the cutoff line. And it's interesting to see... So uh, partly it's totally subjective, but I think more deeply than that, there are certain things that I consider to be very, like, major songwriting problems with this record that are also characteristic of those old heavy prog heavy metal bands. Mm-hmm. Uh, I think given that I have become a lot more into just straight up heavy metal through doing this show with you and through what kind of quality stuff has been coming out in the last few years... I become a lot more receptive to a lot of the kinds of ideas on here or whatever. But this record is interesting. That definitely reminded me. Oh, okay. Oh, I, I guess I'm still a punk. <laughs> um, uh, the um, you know, it's like okay. So basically, I mean, well, honestly, we should get to your sample first. I think because there are certain parts on this that we. This record is full of brilliant moments. And it's full of brilliant extended passages. It's full of brilliant sort of song sketches. Uh, There is all sorts of stuff to enjoy here. There are awesome lyrics. Um, There are really cool moments in the vocal performance. And, you know, Cromlech's characteristic uh, manly (laughs) ad-libs. You know, uh, there is, uh, you know, obviously dazzling musicianship, which you'll talk about. Uh, And... And there is, uh, what was was the last thing I was going to get to? I mean, it, there's just a lot of stuff here that is really good. Um, the, 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 the complaints I have have to do with things like structure. Um, but there are certain things we just agree on. So we both agree that Born with Sword in Hand, Doomed to Martyrdom is great. Yeah, uh, that is our first sample. We're going to be going out of chronological order on this one to try to elucidate our points a little bit better. Um, so I would say this is, I think you'd also agree, this is sort of the most traditional Cromlech song on the record. Yeah, yeah. Yeah, so uh, it, it's definitely a highlight, and I'd say it's probably the most approachable song on the record. That, that's the thing. This is like a... An, a a front loaded with challenge kind of record. Like it wouldn't surprise me if people tried to listen to this and bounced off it just because there's so much shit going on right up front. Um, so here's a song that's a little bit more accessible, but I'd argue that it's just as sort of densely plotted and filled with Mm -hmm. difficult stuff as any of the more like out there material on this. Um, so let's listen to this and let's listen to very specifically a lot of the lead guitar work. And I've got some more music theory ish stuff to talk about, which will lead into how this whole album is constructed.
Okay, so uh, melodically, that's a very approachable part of this record, but even though it's more straightforward, you can tell just how dense it is. I mean, that's a that's a longer sample. That's toward three minutes, but there's probably, you know, seven distinct riff figures in there. And then if you extrapolate that across the rest of the song, it, you didn't get all of them at once right there. There's, there's a lot of shit going on across all these songs. Um, so you can now kind of hear, uh, those of you listening at home, the way these songs are arranged, uh, rather than in a definitive upward climb, uh, a lot of these songs are dotted with these sort of mini arcs narratively that will arrive at a medium sized climax. Um, usually a, a huge stonker is reserved for the end, but there's a distinct ebb and flow to the energy of these songs, which I really like. Um, from a melodic perspective, there's a lot of interesting, tricky stuff that occurs across this record on guitar um, that might sound kind of inf- unfamiliar because it seems to me to be rooted in uh, mid-80s NWO BHM stuff, which still retained a lot of the rock guitar technique that those bands would have had at the time. I'm talking about stuff like, you know, a Jaguar, uh, all these random bands that just put out a couple seven inches and broke up. Um, so when you're listening to it, you'll hear some intervallic choices that sound really spicy or almost dissonant, but they're not. They're just really unfamiliar. You got to go back and you got to think about early Iron Maiden. Uh, think about the chorus on Invaders or something, which is bizarre and sounds dissonant these days, but that's actually just a sort of strange holdover of folk rock ideas that hadn't been removed from heavy metal yet. Um, another thing that makes this record really interesting and really challenging is that Cromlech, like all heavy metal bands, really likes to do A, B variations on their riffs, but usually the B variation isn't just the change of the, the, the tail end rollout of the riff, uh, a lot of the time they're not arriving back at the root note of the first variation. They're playing with the contours of it, sort of like they often do uh, in the sister band, Into Oblivion. But it's very weird to hear something so difficult and almost jazzy in the way that it's set up in what is presented as a very straightforward, epic, heavy metal record. But I think all the, uh, all the real magic on this album is found in the weirdest and most progressive moments and the constantly constantly choosing the more difficult path in how to construct these songs, um, which I can certainly understand being a, a tricky thing for people to get into. But for someone like me who listens to a lot of prog rock and a lot of weird 70s stadium music, I think it's really cool to hear all these things bounce off each other. Yeah, so, I mean... I don't, I think you're responding, you're responding in part to stuff I wrote in the notes that I think I'm not, wouldn't emphasize as much anymore. Um, I think, uh, which, but, but fair enough, I'll, I'll, I'll address it, right? An overwhelming, uh, impression I had when I first listened to this that I also had on the 2017 and 18 material, but I think didn't matter as much in that context was that at times, um, it sounds like there are tuning problems. I'm not accusing these guys of being out of tune because I'm sure they know a hell of a lot more about being in tune than I do. Um, however, uh, there there are simply there are parts where it just seems like things go out of key, possibly because of how they're written. It happens most with the guitar leads. It doesn't happen at all during that sample. Uh, those riffs were all just awesome. Um, the the Maidenny riff at the beginning was great. It had this strange major tonality in it. You could hear that. Uh, the more dissonant sort of Celtic death thrash thing after it was awesome. Uh, the sort of cascading triplet riff. Mm-hmm. Um, uh, and, you know, the sort of... Uh, they, they they incorporate those chord changes and uh, root note changes into the riffs there uh, while maintaining very clear direction and momentum. Mm-hmm. Um, I, I think as far as the tonality, like, some of it, like, I liked, you know, the, the sort of... I, I've also played this for, you know, someone else and was and, and they got the same impression, mm-hmm. right, uh, the, about the, the weird harmonies. Um, 
I, I think on further listening, it doesn't matter as much. I think it has something to do in many places with what you say. They're attempting very strange harmonic stuff, like playing, say, playing something that sounds like extreme metal under something that sounds like, you know, playing something with that's extremely dissonant under something that's working in a more consonant tone, things mm-hmm. like that, right? Yeah. The, well, one thing. Some I should, of it's from that. One well, thing I should emphasize that. Mm-hmm. will probably be an important point of discussion is that um, you don't hear it on this sample, but you will hear it across the record is Cromlech are often am- attempting to make like fully polyphonics uh, arrangements or- between the guitars. Um, so there are parts that are not in a sort of sensible harmony to us, but they're just drawing on much, much older traditions, which it's very fair to say you don't like those parts because they're very difficult. Well, it's. I don't think the issue I have with this record is that it's difficult. Um, I think I agree about the polyphony thing, um, or counterpoint, or whatever. I, I'm sure there's a technical distinction there. Uh, but um, you know, the um, I love the ambition with the the you know the polyphony. Uh, I you know, in some ways, it's a lot like stuff I really like. It's a lot like sentenced. It's a lot like that first at the gates record. It's kind of like Soren in some ways, mm-hmm. although Soren just writes everything in this really weird, in this kind of one this, really weird harmonic. This, mode. this awful scathing motif. <laughs> yes, yeah, 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 yeah. That's just um, yeah, yeah. Like take the other guitar and put it next to mine, but make it horrible, um, <laughs> right? Uh, but so there's. Uh, I think, like, yeah, so where would I go? I think the issue is not that I find it too difficult. The The issue is that I find it too civilized. Mm, okay. Um, I find that throughout the record, Cromlech are holding back. Hmm. And they're holding back because of their incredible ambition. Uh, I, I think this this record is written with the idea that I remember when talking with them, right? They talked scornfully of verse chorus structures, structures, so much the better, right? Mm-hmm. They, you know, uh, we've heard in Into Oblivion how the all these guys are very skillful at working outside those parameters, right? They do stuff that's through composed or stuff that has uh, echoes of earlier riffs, but they've been transformed, right? So the goal here is seems to be to go as far away from verse chorus as possible. And there's a there's the conceit that this is structurally sophisticated classically influenced music. Mm-hmm. Um which is also to some degree baked into those old prog metal bands you're talking about. Uh and I I think it leads to puzzling structural choices uh that um come across as uh, as an aesthetic of thwarting musically. Um, and I'll, I'll show you what I mean. So we're going to listen to the first track, Samaria. Uh, this is a 15-minute song. Um, there's a lot of shit in here that I love. I like listening to it. Uh, there are riffs that get stuck in my head. Honestly, there are riffs throughout, from out the record, throughout the record that get stuck in my head, right? Uh, there's some very memorable stuff here. Um... But this is a 15-minute track, and on it, there are seven minutes of locked-in metal. Um, There is a three-minute song that sort of comes in after the five-minute intro. There is a three-minute song that's kind of like an amoebics or thrasher. Um, That song kind of ends, uh, and then... Uh, there's an interstitial moment, which is what I'm going to focus on. Uh, and then there's this sprawling sort of doom folk passage that closes it, kind of like they rewrote their own Foggy Dew. Uh, um, and that's about four minutes. Uh, and I, I think the first thing is brilliant. I think the second thing is pretty damn good. Uh, and the more I listen to it, the more I like it. But, um, you know... Uh, if you want to, and you know, if you you can be, uh, you can play devil's advocate and say, let's also count the core of the intro. So from around a minute forty in to about three minutes in, uh, that has an, a really awesome part. The only thing you could ever refer to as a Cossack beat down chorus. It's a <laughs> thrilling introduction. Uh, 
And that fills it out for about 8.5 minutes. But you can hear right at the end of that Cossack beatdown chorus the tendency that goes throughout the record, which is they're finishing this extraordinary part, they're ready to light into the music, and they immediately pull back key change dueling tandem guitars. In this case, it's absurd, but it works. (laughs) It's like the the, the guitar work is so awesome, it pulls you up key-wise and tension-wise, and then prepares just a, a crashing drop into the into the main riff, right? Um, so there's there's something there that it, there this uh, this uh, technique of deferral and displacement works really well, um, but that's in part because it does work toward a payoff, um, not just not at all a conventional like, not at all a conventional breakdown into main riff payoff. Um, the ah. Uh, so now we're going to get to, to to my sample, which is from the middle of this. Uh, basically, we're coming in at the end of the thing that's kind of like an amoebic song. And you're going to hear it open up, uh, and it is really strong. You'll get some of the strangest, most at the gatesy kind of, or extreme death thrash intervals you'll get on the record. Uh Kevin has to find a way to sing melodically over this, and here he nails it. There's like, you know, putting actual notes in uh, a performance over a dissonant riff is really hard, and he he pulls it off. It sounds odd the first time you hear it, but it's awesome. Um, But there's this... uh, Past this, you'll hear them start piling on one awesome idea after another. Uh, and often with ingenious, powerful transitions before it, be, or uh, b- between them. And you think, okay, surely we're going back to the core of the song. But it starts sort of bellying out, and the fact that the riffs are good stops mattering so much. And just listen.
was a queen riff, and it's sapped <laughs> by will to live. I I agree with you that 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 ending sort of queen section is not great. Uh, I think that it's some sort of like kind of internal musical joke in the band, but I get your point about that. But everything leading up to it, I actually really enjoy. I feel like everything leading up to it kind of had to lead to it. I, I think basically like, okay, uh, let me run through all the things that happened there. Um, we So first we get that kind of um, sort of a, a, a B or C section of a death thrash song with the uh, sort of careening vocals over it, which is very cool. That gets hit with a dissonant interrupter riff. There's some pivoting. Uh, we drop into Chug with a harsh kind of Celtic solo. Very Rich Walker. Awesome. Uh, almost immediately then, we get a major key change. Uh, okay, it's a very powerful key change. Also very new Dark Age. Uh, that sets up a crushing and beautiful chorus. However... There's already something, I mean, it's the point of the chorus, it's doomy and heavy, but there's something kind of tired feeling about the chorus. Uh, and, and, and as it wraps up, you can hear, uh, there, there's another key change. Key change managed supremely well, beautiful Cossack chorus comes back, but even as that happens, they hit the suck pedal. <laughs> um, and what you get is a, uh, a wand, a solo, a guitar solo lost in majorish key ideas, wandering around, uh, ser searching for a core idea, eventually sort of finds it near the end. Uh, but then it sort of dies off into this awkward glam rock idea, which sounds as enervated as the music is by this point. It's what I would say happens here is a kind of subtractive effect. There, almost every one of those parts is great, may, sometimes even brilliant, but the more they stack them on each other, the less it becomes. Mm. Uh, and I, I think there's a consistent less than the sum of its parts effect in the structure throughout this record. Um, okay, I think. I think, like, and that's following on a fair amount of shit that's already happened in this song, right? Like a five-minute intro. Mm -hmm. uh, so it, it's, um, so so where from there? Like, I, I think that's, that's really my central sort of complaint about the song, right? It, there's this, or about, about the record. You get this riff, th this long passage of attrition, and finally this riff, which works to cancel things that came before it. Um, and I, I think these are... Uh, I think this is coming from an excessive reverence for classical music, which mm -hmm. is something that you normally don't like, uh, maybe even, even more than me. Uh, but, and, and I think is is a real tendency among metal people. It's obviously very cool to be seriously influenced by classical music and capable of pulling it off, which Cromlech are, mm -hmm. right? Without question. Uh, however, I think maybe there are certain things about the way classical music does structure that they have they're really interested in uh, and are doing here, even though it doesn't necessarily work. So, like, right? Um, they, whether you're talking about a symphony or something like opera, right? These guys are really influenced by Wagner. Um, it works. It, it, there's a principle of development that works through high contrast, right? Uh, minor key theme, answering major key B theme, variations on both, development, third theme, development of third theme, etc. Mm -hmm. Um that often works within this massive, you know, in like a romantic symphony or something, there's this massive architectonic to it, this structure that you can track. Uh, and there's this organic way that the themes develop, like in Beethoven. But um, in opera, which is more narrative, it might be a little more jagged, obviously. But um, uh, they're not 
to their credit, they are not attempting to uh, literally imitate those structures in a metal context at all, right? This is much more like big block composition. Mm-hmm. Uh, e- even even when they do seven things in a row, they're all kind of like this juxtaposition of blocks. Um, but the thing they keep is the idea that um, musical sophistication equates to... Uh, musical sophistication equates to elaborate structure mm-hmm. and equates to... Um, and that musical motion is uh, developmental motion. Uh, motion over the course of the song structure rather than a motion that's intrinsic to the riff itself. Um, to be an idiot, uh, I think metal obviously owes a lot to classical music, but I also think it has its own original thing to say. Uh, I think it makes a meaningful contribution to and adjustment to and an alternative to that tradition uh, in that metal is based on uh, don't play the bad part. <laughs> um and this and it you know there's an emphasis on sustained on on repetition on sustained atmosphere uh and on not changing things just for changing things sake uh and i think like here uh is a good example of where that goes wrong so samaria is two to three brilliant songs that have kind of well, it's either something like, it's either two sort of, it's either two brilliant songs that have been artificially broken off and sutured together. The first song, the amoebic song, never finishes. The second song, the, the, the doom folk song, starts in the middle of it. Mm-hmm. Or it is a single song that has been stretched on the rack and tortured to death. Um... And there was an original version of this song that is awesome and that I wish I could hear. Um, but I think basically this is, there is a a labored and artificial approach to structure. And th- I know these guys want to make barbaric music. This to me evokes all the techniques that are baked into classical music as a way of controlling, diverting, and... Uh, civilizing the threat of impassioned melody. That's not their intent. That's not Cromlech's intent. It's just a thing about classical music, and it's one of its weaknesses. Hmm. I guess um, I, I guess the weird thing is I don't even necessarily disagree with you on 90% of that. Um, I, I think that this does very deliberately court classical tradition and it is a neoclassical metal album in the sort of strictest sense of that term. Um, I, I want to clarify that a lot of my problems with the, the worship of classical tradition in heavy metal really has more to do with the fact that it's usually extremely surface level. Um, uh, the fact that it's it's mostly about replicating timbres and just mm-hmm. replicating scope without ever really digging into the, the structural conceits of that music or even just how it works on a more granular level, which is not which is obviously not an issue with Cromlech, who actually listened to classical music. Yes, you know, you know most yes. most guys that say, oh, you know, metal and classical music, they are much more they're listening to movie soundtracks. They're not listening to fucking Wagner, you know. Um, so I guess, yeah, no. And, and these guys definitely get the internal machinery of classical music. They also get what's awesome about it and are capable of delivering that. Yeah. I, I, I guess the argument that I would make isn't even really an argument. It just has something to do with taste or what you have more time for. Um, I, I think that it's important to distinct that beyond merely being classical, Cromlech is extremely operatic in the way they construct these songs. Yes. Yes. Um, and I think the thing about being operatic, being authentically operatic, is that you are engaging with an internal narrative on a much deeper level than most songs do, which is, mm. which is fine. I have no problem with songs just being what they are. But here, um, if you're going to make truly operatic music, it requires you to really construct that music around the flow of this internal narrative and to 
structurally reflect the ethos behind it in ways that are, uh, you know, I say challenging, but like sometimes deliberately sort of deliberately disappointing, you know, deliberately weak in some cases, uh, you know, deliberately brittle sonically. And there's a perfectly fair argument to make that a heavy metal album should never be those things. And in a lot of situations, I would agree. But I guess my point is, um, to use a very strange analogy, if you play video games from, say, the mid-90s, and you're engaged in combat in any of those games, there's some enemies in those games that just suck to fight. They're, They're not fun. They're designed to be annoying or arduous and that was blight town yeah blight town uh so blight town blight town was not an accident blight town is deliberately obnoxious and infuriating to the player because that links to the narrative of dark souls i assume you're never going to catch me watching a three-hour dark souls lore video but i'm gonna say i'm correct Um, (laughs) um so with that in mind there are some parts of this album that are deliberately frustrating or deliberately enervating. And for me, it works just because I think those are sort of relatively minor in the scope of the whole album, and they add a different kind of contrast than I'm used to from a more traditionally constructed heavy metal album. Um, But I think your point is valid. Should a heavy metal song ever be those things? I don't know if I have an answer, but it's also a case where I don't know how many other bands I've heard even attempting this, so I, I'm glad it's around as an example of the idea. Yeah, well, that is certainly true, and something I guess I could have said up front and was going to say at the end. I mean, this is definitely profoundly original, mm-hmm. right? Um, and maybe I'll sur- I'll come back to it at the end, but I think that despite the things I don't like about it, it could become an important album. Mm-hmm. Uh, but... Um, it, it's definitely original. I mean, I think one fundamental difference in our tastes is that you're much more invested in the in the uh, narrative paradigm for songwriting. Yeah, that's that's like almost essential to most yeah. of the things that I make personally. And that's a very heavy metal aesthetic. Mm-hmm. Um, I tend to think that there are certain specific that like if you're dealing with language, say, uh, narrative makes a lot of sense, right? If you're dealing with uh, with music, it's a whole different medium, and you want to emphasize the things that are specific to that medium, which isn't necessarily narrative, mm-hmm. although it can be. Uh, some people are total fucking autists about this, right, in, in <laughs> art criticism yeah, and shit. Yeah. Uh, you know, there's like, this is pure music, uh, uh, you know. Um, that's, that's, making... that's, how they, that's how they get smart people to listen to House. You know. Right, that that's how you get twelve tone music. Um, but the um, but like, I'm more interested in processes and actions and moods. And if it has a narrative feeling to it, cool. I feel like maybe this is stupid rock critic of me, but I feel like there's a way of following where the song or the riff leads. And very often there is a highly mannered and deliberate refusal to follow where the song leads. Oh, well, uh, yeah. No, I can, I can, and, I can absolutely and, and it, agree with that. And, and it's because of the artistic ambition. It's because this notion that this is structurally rigorous classical music. I've got, I've got some more examples. I guess since I'm just going to keep fucking hammering on this one note, I've got another example. But the other thing I wanted to say about opera, you're exactly right. And so I think part of it is that, like, I think opera is a intrinsically gay (laughs) Um, and the thing that makes Wagner great is that he was straining against its confines Um, and also I don't I guess I probably don't like Wagner as much as them I think there's there's stuff about it that is uh, um, uh, sort of florid and decadent and uh, sort of uh, at times, something like Tristan, kind of languid in a way that I don't really like. Uh, however, there's all it's also awesome. And I would say one thing that distinguishes Wagner is that relative to people at his time, his music was found to be extremely repetitive. It's mm-hmm. kind of this en- endless, mournful ululation, 
right? These guys are into the ring cycle, which is more punctuated, mm-hmm. right? So you've you know you've got your ride for the Valkyries or ride ride of the Valkyries. Jesus, I, I'm like fucking up prepositions today. Um, <laughs> I'm thinking so hard that grammar is breaking down. <laughs> um, uh, I, I have to try this hard to justify being a hater. Um, so okay, so let's. Uh, with that said about opera, I, I think um, let's go to false peace, total war. I think everyone who's heard this record, you included, agrees this is the weakest track. It is. It's almost a cheap shot to sample. I just figured, like, if I'm going to be making this point, I think I need to sample it. Uh, it's and, and I think it means a lot when the record is front-loaded with stuff like this. As you say, there's a, def- a, a difficulty barrier, but it's not just like Revelation of Doom on, uh, you know... Uh, under the uh, sign of hell. Yeah, yes, exactly. See, I'm for I'm f- under the sign of hell. One of my favorite records. Boom. <laughs> it's not just Revelation of Doom, right? This is like there's a tw- twenty two or twenty three minute uh, difficulty barrier, and it's a difficulty barrier that I think happens because of structural flaws and very trying to be difficult. So let's go to False Peace slash Total War. Um, And we're going to go, there's been a kind of long, doomish buildup, but sort of up-tempo, right? They're constantly ratcheting up the tempo, the vocals are escalating, uh, and and then we're coming in at the end of that, uh, and the song starts to go into more of a, a thrash format. So that is a thrash song that almost started. <laughs> and um, really weird left field thing I just realized. Uh, for some reason, I bet these guys listen to a lot of guar. Whoa. Far. Okay, now uh, explain. Oh, because uh, I was thinking while you were playing, it's like, because, okay, I agree this is the weakest song, but I still like it. And that led me into thinking about how a lot of people... <laughs> The the bizarre situation in our partnership where I actually like a lot of musical theater and stuff. 
Mm -hmm. Um, Mm -hmm. (laughs) And uh, I was thinking of those contrasting sections of, like, I don't know the lyrics, but I'm, like, guessing that these are, like, different characters speaking to each other. So it's jackknifing between these two sort of weird motifs in this high contrast arrangement. And I realized that's how uh, Guar writes a lot of their weirder songs, too, which is in this very exaggerated, deliberately synthetic sort of musical theater way. That is a very fair point. I actually wish we had the lyrics. Um, I, I ordered the CD, but I, I, I don't think it's here yet. Mm-hmm. Uh, um, the the lyrics are always, whatever you can hear of them. is just, yeah, yeah. It, Every Cromlech phrase is inherently cool and makes you <laughs> want to take your shirt off. Um, but, like, the... Um, uh, yeah, that's that's an interesting idea. I mean, I think the thing is, yeah, like a lot of these old prog heavy metal bands, right? With like the ideal was the rock opera. Oh and, yeah, and, no, I was and, absolutely going to say that this is sort of almost like metal's Quadrophenia by the Who. And, and I exactly, and I hate that album. And I, I love just that album. <laughs> I, I find opera to just be a sort of a it's it's high culture, but that don't mean it's good. I think it's it's stilted and over refined, uh, highly, uh, highly mannered, um, and kind of unlistenable. Um, it, it's certainly difficult. Um, <laughs> as for this, right? Uh, I guess the thing that's you can hear that there's a similar way it's structured to the first track to Samaria. Uh, this this track is they deliberately divide it into two sections, right? Mm-hmm. False peace and total war. Um, and you get the, uh, you get some of the ratcheting up there and then we get, um, again, sort of the technique that they use to start the lyrics section on Samaria coming out of the intro. It's what you could call a forced transition. They set up a big drop and then suddenly they start with a riff that sounds like it's in the middle of a thrash song, Mm -hmm. right? Uh... You know, so like, is suddenly we're in mid-tempo chug at the start of Samaria. It's super brutal. It sounds sort of arbitrary, but it's like the arbitrariness of sovereign decision, right? Yeah. It's just like you, you are spared. You will be executed, but I did nothing wrong. Doesn't matter, right? You know, <laughs> Arbit- it's the- arbitrary in the way a Celtic Frost song is constructed. Yes, and arbitrary in the way that so- that Cromlech is at their best, right? You know, the-, the king commands the song start now, and he wants it to start on the chug riff. Um, <laughs> uh, they do a similar thing here. It just sounds it sounds forced in the way where it dra- that it drags, uh, and. Uh, and and continuing to do this is again one of these more sort of like um, rarefied, highly reflective, conscious, highly reflective ways of writing a song. Uh, and it it sort of they keep sort of after this they they keep they they change that up by continually ratcheting up the root note. It's not exactly a key change. You could just say they're going up the scale but it's a similar effect. Mm-hmm. Uh, they do that a lot. It sets up another drop. They drop into the middle of an, another thrash riff, right? Mm-hmm. Uh, and then do the same thing. I can't really quite tell where the song changes, um, but it, it's basically like we are constantly both, we are always in the intro to something, always building up, never locked in, and at the same time, also always in a transitional or interstitial part of a song. Mm-hmm. And that doesn't mean there aren't awesome moments there, right? The, the moment where they have like the kind of Dark Angel riff. That's really cool. Yeah, the downbeat there. And when that hits, I'm like, oh, fuck yeah, it's starting. And even the next riff. I like that one. It's better than the first one. But then it just runs through the same... Uh, because it's going for some sort of structural parallelism, some sort of narrative effect, it runs through the same sort of uh, chromatic chord changes. Uh, you know, um, and, you know, and yeah, I, I, I do not like it. Uh, I think I have made my, uh, I think I've made my essential points, and now, uh, Death Metal Guy, back to you. Oh, um... No, this is, you see, this is an interesting discussion because it's raising so many questions. I know we've talked about stuff like this before, but you, you just weren't raised on dad rock, were you? I kind of was, but it never grabbed me, man. I got I, you. 
I, I, you know, I listened to some Hendrix and liked it pretty well. I listened to some Zeppelin and liked it a lot, although not all of it, right? Mm -hmm. I've been going back to it lately. I actually listened to Led Zeppelin 1 the other day and was like, damn, this is great, except for the eight-minute blues jam. Yeah, but you um, weren't listening to uh, the Queen and the Who and stuff. Like well, that. my dad got me Who records, and based on how he described them, I thought I'd love them, and I just didn't. Ah, uh, I like, got you. You know, like my generation or, ma you know, my generation, maybe Magic Buzz. There are a couple, like, things that are undeniable, right? Mm -hmm. But, like, yeah, no, I, I, I couldn't get into The Who. Uh, um, and... I know you're not a Floyd guy. Definitely not. And I think the closest they would come for me that I liked a lot then and still like a lot is Zeppelin. Okay, gotcha. Yeah, no, the, it's interesting because we're... As we know more and more about each other's taste, these sort of fine grained distinctions uh, yeah. matter more in a sense. Yeah. Um, and I think a lot of the our the discrepancy in our opinion on this record comes down to like the kind of metalhead we are and how we got there. In that, I'm almost like more of this classic style metalhead who grew up on ambitious classic rock and that formed a, a foundational idea for me mm -hmm. about what I liked in music. Yeah. And then you, on the other hand, came to it slightly later than me and you're coming out of uh, punk and uh, various other sort of parallel genres to heavy yeah. metal, whereas I, I followed this very distinct sequence. So as a result, um, I'm primed for, like we say on the show, long hair ideas yeah. more easily than you Yeah, the, the thing I was looking for that I couldn't find in classic rock or in jazz, which I actually played a bit, right, mm -hmm. was dumb repetitive noise. Hi, um, gotcha. yeah. and uh, you know, um, the, and and once I found reliable sources of dumb repetitive noise, is when my musical journey truly began. Well, uh, that which is funny because my musical journey sort of truly began with Meshuga, which is dumb repetitive noise, but also extremely musiciany. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I think I always like. Yeah, it's undeniable that the subjective long hair, short hair distinction is a big factor here. It's just like, I would just argue to the hilt that those are bad features of long hair that punks, that the punk influenced extreme metal just like corrected. Mm -hmm. And and you would just say, no. <laughs> oh, <laughs> you would just. Yeah. I, 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 I agree with you on the basic point that I do not want most heavy metal to sound like this. Mm -hmm. Like, like okay, yeah. th this is one of those um, isolate records yeah. where I am very glad this exists. And I'm also equally glad that nobody else is really attempting it because this would be a fucking disaster in 99.9% .9 of hands. Um, this, this record for me threads a very precise needle that accesses all the like long hair high art things that I like and manages to avoid a lot of the stuff that I don't just because I, I believe these guys are on just such a caliber of songwriting and musicianship. They can do stuff that other people fundamentally can't. Um, but no, I think, I think the structure of your argument, I pretty much wholeheartedly agree with it. It's just whether it applies to this record or not that I, that I take issue with. Um, but let me get to uh, let me get to my last sample, um, which is just the highlight of a record like this is obviously going to be the closing epic. You know, it's mm -hmm. nearly 19 mm -hmm. minutes long. It's called Turumbar, Master of Doom by Doom Mastered. Um, and a little note that I want to put in here that is interesting uh, and sort of speaks to how I how well I think this. Uh, how well I think this record communicates its narrative. So I, I didn't know what the fuck Turumbar was, but I had gotten the sense that there was something about the arc of this track that struck me as being sort of maybe some sort of weird heavy metal opera reinterpretation of Oedipus Rex or something like that. Hmm. Uh, so a few a few listens in, I decided yeah. to look up Turambar. I find out that it's like a, a king from uh, Tolkien's writings, primarily featured in the Silmarillion. Mm -hmm. And then I just I did a quick read of it because I can only do that for so long. Anything connected to the Silmarillion before my eyes fall out of my fucking head. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> but so Turambar <laughs> is a, uh, a you know some some sort of uh, king of men or maybe an elf. I can't remember. 
but um, Turin is Turin is a king who uh, gets along with elves. He might be half elven, but I think that's his. I think that's his, one of his son. I think that's his son or I something. Gotcha. I I don't know. So anyway, long story short, the you know his his tragedy concludes with uh, learning that his wife was his sister. And they say that... Oh, oh yeah, well, then it's definitely not his son. <laughs> well, yeah, but... <laughs> yeah, but, and, he's, he's, a, he's a mortal. And yeah. people and people make the point about how, uh, you know, obviously this is at least in part a reinterpretation of Oedipus Rex. Now, I have no way to prove that I felt that before I read it, but you guys can take it on good faith. No. I was able to get that from this music alone as removed from the source material no, as you, it is. You were really on the right track. Absolutely. There was there there's that sort of instinctive you just the thing objectively existed and you sensed it for sure. That yeah. makes a lot of sense. And any time an album can do that, I'm mm-hmm. fucking amazed and I think that that it like if there is a single indication of a record success mm-hmm. to be able to communicate such a detailed idea with no reference points except for sound is insane and it appeals to all of my fixation on narrative music um but anyway so turambar master of doom by doom mastered longest track on the record goes through an enormous series of peaks and valleys and i just want to highlight one of the climactic moments that for me was was massive and i'll I'll talk about kind of the scale this record operates on a little bit more after we're done but for now i just really want to highlight this um mid-song climax The first time I played this record, th- that part blew my fucking face off. I'm still cleaning the stain off my goddamn <laughs> wall. Like, <laughs> oh my god! You know, the, the one point that I want to make, and this isn't really addressing criticisms of you, but criticisms a lot of people seem to have of this record or this style in general. Yes, there are ways to make these ideas more compact and concise and delivered in a way that is more broadly accessible or even like broadly understandable. But quantity is a quality unto itself. Um, 
speed is a quality unto mm-hmm, itself. Mm-hmm, these mm-hmm. are not just random parameters. Nope. These are these are parts of what makes art art. And for me, the 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 slow like agonized build up to that that final moment, you know, that 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 vocal melody that keeps climbing until it's, you know, at the absolute upper end of Kevin's natural non-falsetto range. And just that that quaver to his voice, this, this moment of just perfect uh, tragedy and spiritual turmoil. It's it's so evocative and so powerful, and it, it, it manifests what I think are the most important parts of this kind of narrative songwriting that I'm talking about. Um, it reinforces the power of this idea that did not even need to be communicated to me through lyrics or knowledge of the subject matter or anything. The idea came fully formed into my head, and it's because of stuff like that. Um, it's a the, the passage up there is a beautiful blending of everything that goes into Cromlech's music, you know, this very bluesy, trad-doom-inspired stuff on one side and this ambitious neoclassical stuff on the other, working together in, in perfect tandem to create this, this apex moment for the song. And... Um, throughout the song, it gets even further. I, I fully admit I wrote it in the notes when we got to the, the final sort of closing climax of this album. I actually teared up, which is not a thing that I do for heavy metal albums. But I did because the sheer weight of everything that had come before it was so powerful. And that couldn't be executed with a normal-sized album, and it couldn't be executed with any lower ambitions. Um, it's just, it's, it's such a, a striking thing. And the way I really listen to this album is almost like a funeral doom album. The idea mm-hmm. that there are parts that are deliberately trudging and, uh, have a sort of animosity to the listener. But when you get to those final moments, those conclusive things that, that take in all the weight of of the music prior on a very extended time scale, there's a feeling there that I just don't think you can get from something more direct and compact. Yeah. I think, um, that part is, yeah, immense. Um, uh, it, it sort of deliberately parallels the end of Ave Mortis, uh, which is, uh, shadow and flame, which is about the fall of Gondolin. Um, mm. So that's that's the, the you know the downfall of the El, uh, the Elven Kingdom hidden in the mountains, yeah. um, and that one is a mere nine minutes. Uh, <laughs> th- th- this one is th- yeah. This one is how, how long? Uh, this is like double that length. Yeah, this yeah. Is this is like eighteen thirty six. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Um, <clears throat> it's uh, so it's 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 basically. That one was also really the highlight of the record, and so this one is also a highlight or the highlight, right? Um, I I agree with you, yeah. Like I agree with you that quantity is also a quality. Uh, I think I agree that the criticisms people are mostly throwing at it, like oh, it's just too much. Oh, it's like cluttered or what, whatever. Yeah, I I don't agree with that. Right. The yeah, it's it's awesome that they're attempting to work on this scale. Uh it's the the slow build up to that is very powerful. Uh I I think probably those people are trying to say something like what I was saying about the structure. Mm-hmm. And and that's initially my impression too. I was sort of my simple take on it was, yeah, there's just too much. And then I had to go away and think about it for like a week to figure out what I was actually trying to say. Uh but the um yeah i would say you know for this song i think the beginning of it is a little still a little digressive for me we're already 10 minutes in when we get there mm-hmm. uh to, to that moment um I, yeah i basically think we differ on whether on the weight of the previous material i think they do things constantly that makes it less weighty mm um, I, see, I find all the diversions and stuff to be part of that weight. Yes. 
Yeah, I think that's that's the fundamental difference. I mean, obviously, some of them I think really contribute to the songs in a in a powerful way, right? Uh, I, like even a lot of them. But you know, fifty fifty or even seventy five twenty five is not a great ratio, I'd say. Um, but uh, you know, um, I I think like another thing we should talk about uh, is like the vocals, mm-hmm. right? Um, and this track is by far, uh, Kevin's sort of tour de force as a vocalist. Um, the, that sort of, uh, the climax delivered there is awesome. Uh, I think the big question about Cromlech in a way for a long time, it's something I, I sort of try, you know, talked a bit about in the interview with them is, Right is is Kevin's vibrato vocals, <coughs> mm-hmm. and um, it's one of the oddest features of Cromlech. And back then, I thought that the way they would, you know, it was sort of an odd feature of the music, but it made sense to me in the context of totally unhinged, uh, totally unhinged, kind of deliberately clattering, r- raw, uh, maximalist epic doom, right? or extreme heavy metal. Uh, it, the vibrato is sort of, and I'm, I'm not sure it makes as much sense in this context. Uh, and I, I thought what they were trying to do with it was use it as a kind of harsh vocal, right? A vibrato is an affect. It's, it's, and in that way, there are certain people, believe it or not, uh, who think that like screaming is affected Right, mm. they're like, why can't you just sing like a normal person? Oh. It's like, <laughs> they don't understand yeah. that it's like <laughs> exactly like well, and think about like an old old rock critic back in the day. All these kids screaming, like you know, the whole point was that like you know uh, a rock and roll artist might scream, or James Brown might scream as punctuation, right? Mm. Or uh, you know um, that it was supposed to represent peak emotion, and then there were these bands that just composed screaming all the time, right? It's like writing a sentence only in exclamation marks, yeah, right? Yeah. And to you or me, it's like a sentence made only of exclamation marks. Sounds awesome. Yeah, it right? sounds like they're really excited. Uh, <laughs> right? Another example, um, uh, yeah, and so vibrato is normally meant to convey peak emotion in a vocal. Uh, and it's another way of conveying peak emotion. And Cromlech have decided to stick it on as a near constant. Mm-hmm. So w- on the last record, I-, I thought, you know, on Iron Guard, I sort of thought the idea was you're using the vibrato like screaming to create an extreme vocal that is still sort of has tone to it, is still more like a classic heavy metal vocal. On this record, and to do that, to really make that work, you would have to simplify it. It would have to become more like just singing the root note. Um, on this record, they seem to have gone the other way. And swinging towards trying to actually, actually get some sort of opera vocals. Um, the thing that strikes me as not working about it is that it is clearly not his natural voice, right? And and I don't just mean that vibrato. The vibrato is like a thing you put on because of course you do, right? Mm-hmm. Uh, he's he's singing from the upper chest in like. It, it's not coming from the diaphragm, right? That it's, it sounds like a. It sounds like he is straining his voice just to do the vibrato, mm-hmm. and it is often, if not sort of consistently, going out of key. It's sort of built into it that it goes out of key. Now, if in a ragged, aggressive, high-speed heavy metal song, that's pretty cool, right? That's unhinged, but this is a very hinged record. And so I, I don't know whether it works in this context. Uh, and it strikes me that if Kevin experimented with some other timbers in his voice, uh, they could do, they, he could do more with it, right? So like at the very beginning, there are moments where it sounds like, I'm sure it was deliberate, but there are moments where it almost sounds like he's forgetting to do the vibrato. And it's so much more direct and powerful. Uh, at the very beginning of this sample, he's he's sort of more like declaiming, speaking. 
Uh, and in that mode, it's it's more like almost more like a primordial vocal. There's a, obviously a big similarity to how Alan does vocals in primordial, right? Mm-hmm. Um, there you get you know the 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 sort of the mighty Celtic warrior declaims, and then when the vibrato comes in more, I mean, a he just nails it. He makes it work, right? In in that throughout pa- the passage, also the composition of the lines is ingenious there. Right. Mm -hmm. He he and his bandmates have taken trouble to craft real vocal lines that are not the root notes. And that's commendable. Right. And it really works there. And then when he hits the peak, the vibrato's on full blast. And even though it's kind of wonky, it succeeds in doing the thing, which is a voice at peak emotion almost falling apart. Right. The the slight quaver in the voice of Theoden as he rallies his troops for the last charge. Right. Mm -hmm. You know, um, it's uh it's it's really powerful and you can hear it as somebody racked by grief racked by weight i agree with you that tragedy is very important to this record uh you've mm-hmm. got a good good take on that um and of course that goes with the wagner thing right as yeah. with the the oedipus they take very seriously the idea that this is a tragedy uh and um you know so here i think it work really works well but i would love to hear more of the uh the speaking and direct singing in his natural voice, as well as maybe some screaming. I, I, I feel like, as it is, the vocal, the constant vibrato on this record is one of the things that makes it sound labored. I gotcha. Yeah, so it's it, it sort of like it, it, it kills the immersion for you. Yeah, um, yeah. And, and, you know, think of it this way, man. Like, of the people... This is, you know, this is this review is yet another of this year's uh, kinky role reversals, in terms, <laughs> right? Because I mean, if you stick a fucking guy in, you know, uh, what looks like Celtic slash Mycenaean armor, impaling a dude with a spear, and the fucking menhir has has Celtic knots on it, and there's a fucking go, like I should just automatically like this record, right? <laughs> um. And, and I should be saying, look, look, Death Metal guy, there's a lot that's weird and eccentric about it, but that's why it's good. And, <laughs> and you'd, be like, you'd be like, oh, but there are problems with the performances and blah, blah, blah. In, in, this case, <laughs> in, in this case, I feel like I am so receptive to uh, technically unconventional performances that this should be, I should like it. And if it's not clicking for me, that means that there is a problem to address in how it's being done. That's my claim. I gotcha. And I, I, I think this really is... Um, I, I don't really have an ambitious response to it apart from the fact, you know, I think this is also a taste issue. Uh, you know, I, I really like Kevin's vocal performance throughout the album. I kind of... Uh, it's definitely weird, and I get what you're saying about it being a kind of extreme metal vocal, and we can we can tell that it's being used that way, in a sense, through the production. This is not yeah. front-loading the vocal performance as the primary melodic voice. It's not mm-hmm. like a Maiden record or something. Uh, it's in the thick of it alongside the guitars. And I think with that in mind, it kind of makes sense. You know, the quaver is almost like distortion. Yeah, or a tremolo, a literal tremolo in the voice, right? Yeah, yeah. Tremolo is also sort of forcing a guitar. Yeah, yeah, yeah. It's it's definitely a mannered performance, but at least in terms of how the record is presented, it works for me. I think that if it was at the front of the production... If that was if, if this was designed to be specifically vocal led music, it would be too much. Mm-hmm. Um, but given that it's more of an ensemble cast between all the melodic voices, I I don't have any issue with it having this particular weirdness. And I think it's such an asset at those peak emotional moments that dot the record. Um, I, I'm fine with it being a little bit alien and unfamiliar during. Oh, the oh yeah, I'm not recommending he drop it. I think it's a, a it's a valuable part of the toolkit. I think at those peak moments, it's awesome. Usually, right? Um, uh, yeah. I mean, I think yeah, it's a taste thing. I mean, I also think part this applies to the structure stuff too. I I also just think that like, if a record is swinging for the bleachers in terms of classical ambition, in in, in that sort of thing, I'm gonna seriously hold it to those standards. Yeah. Uh, 
and and in this case, well, okay, they're try- he's trying to sing opera lines, but he's he's not an opera singer, right? Which is no knock against him. It's just massive massive ambition uh that is on this record not panning out but it might point towards future records i think also wait i've got something that ties that in with the tragedy thing too but i'll come Mm -hmm. back to it i I can we'll end on that what i want to say about this record is cromlick write me another record do it in two years and make it so that when i hear that i'm like God damn, now I want to go back and listen more to Ascent of Kings. And in that record, I will hear the beginnings of all the things you're doing in a more uh, spontaneous and more, or a different kind of discipline. I think there's a discipline here in terms of refusing easy pleasures, which is awesome and I commend, right? This is a powerful statement against easy listening metal against simplistic structures against road imitation of you know stuff um but like I, you know there's a different kind of discipline that comes in uh cruel self-censorship and quality control mm-hmm. um and i want to hear more of that and more directness if they just recorded if they didn't even think about those things but just recorded a record faster i think they'd do it just almost automatically um, and I would love, I think if they, they could do a record after this that would suddenly make everything about this one make a ton more sense. And then it would be like, shit, that is an awesome record. It's just sort of so generative and so sort of explosive with different ideas that of course it's not perfectly coherent. Right. Yeah. No, I, I kind of agree with you on that just because listening to this record, I don't think that you can like. I don't think you can do more quantity than this before it starts breaking down, at at least for me. Um, I think this is basically as dense and layered and structurally intricate as a heavy metal record could conceivably get before it just like fractures apart completely and becomes purely academic music. Um, That's why I find it so exciting is because it's so extreme in that regard. I see. Yeah. So for you, it's kind of like, structurally this is i like music that is performance wise barely holding together and you could say that about certain some of the older cromlick stuff and certain uh infamous live performances um <laughs> but the uh you're you you for in a way you find something uh <laughs> kind of roundabout punk in that this is uh it's so over the top heavy metal that it is and so ornate and operatic in its ambitions that it is barely holding together yeah i i do it's i have so much respect for how risky this is and how it's like a house of Mm -hmm. cards but at, at least for me it manages to hold together all the way through. And in a sense, listening to this is very similar to, at least in the feelings I get, listening to one of those really extreme brutal death records that I like, where it's um, it's it's pushing its basic conceit to such a limit, it, it threatens to destroy it completely. You know, it's like, it's like, it's like listening to Enmity or listening to Last Days of Humanity or something like that. Yeah. Well, just in a very different mode. This is certainly extreme heavy metal. Yeah. It's it's very extreme. I think at the beginning of, when I was first starting to listen to this, I thought, oh, they sort of moved away from that and it got more prog heavy metal. But that's just in superficial terms. There's still plenty of at the gatesy stuff all over this, like, and just the death metal ideas. But like... it is, it's a different way of, it is, stru- now it is sort of structurally extreme heavy metal, right? It, yeah. there, there's a lot of extremity. <laughs> this is, this is a very, an extremely extreme album. I will give it that. <laughs> so, uh, Tragedy. Oh, it's a, well, I mean, I can go into it if you want. I just had this sort of like left field idea about the album. Um, do you think that it's, do you think that it has some value? Like what I'm saying? There, oh, or? I think it, I think it has value and I've got something comp sort of, I think complimentary to it. Yeah. So I, 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 yeah. I, I got to this track by, by thinking about Kevin's vocal performance and the way it sounds sort of like strained or even frail at times, but in a way that I really like. And it occurred to me that this whole album 
This whole album is a tragedy. It has plenty of moments of triumph and strength and glory, but I think it's ultimately a tragedy. You know, I think the secret mm-hmm. of Ascent of Kings is that Cromlech is Cromlech is the guy getting stabbed on the album. <laughs> They're not the guys doing the stabbing. Yeah, and yeah, in, yeah, yeah. And in 99% of metal, you're the guy doing the stabbing, and it should be that way. But here, yeah. something different is being accessed. Um, and, you know, for those who know Cromlech's social media presence, they are really into this sort of hyper-masculine alpha kayfabe. You know, we've, we've, t- we've talked to the guys, and they are that. You know, they are all sort of like the heavy metal version of powerlifting werewolf commandos. But they're also, mm-hmm. you know, human beings, and they're very pleasant to talk to. But I think that the fun trick about Cromlech is that while it presents itself as this sort of like brick wall of, you know, masculine strength and virtue, um, it's also extremely nakedly emotional music. Mm-hmm. And I think what's interesting about the way they present it and the way they present strength is in the context of this tragedy. Uh, and to to get very philosophical about it. I think there's a tendency in modern culture and you can attribute it to whatever buzzword you like. It could be, you know, it could be neoliberalism. It could be postmodernism, you know, whatever your preferred term. Modernity. Is. Modernity in general. I, I think there's a tendency in this very postmodern way to see strength failing or uh, strength eventually depleting as indication that the the strength was false yes that it wasn't a, a real thing you know it's it, it's like it's this cultural thing where it's like well you know they hate their dad and now you have to hate your dad too because you know <laughs> b- because you know because your dad fucked up sometime or something but for me I think what's powerful about that idea and especially on this record, is just the idea that, you know, that's it's it's fundamentally not true. You know, someone in a moment of weakness or someone whose strength has been depleted by the world around him, it doesn't invalidate everything that got that no. person there. I, I could even, like, honestly, I can make a parallel in my own life. You know, about six months ago, seven months ago, I went through the hardest times I ever have in my life, you know, emotionally in my personal life. Um and I talked to the black metal guy about it a lot. He helped me through a lot of that oh, process. Thanks, bud. Um, but I guess what I'm saying, and this might self, sound self-aggrandizing, but it's not meant that way, is the fact that I was in a, a very spiritually destitute place and you know I was sort of uh, emotionally broken for a while doesn't invalidate all the things that I've no. done and all the strength no. that I had displayed no. on the way there. It's a moment of time. And I think yeah. that... You know, th- this sort of culture of warped Protestantism where anything that is not permanent and perfect is fake is bullshit. You know, there is yeah. a range of experience, and I think that Cromlech sort of does that. And in a sense, I think that makes it a more realistic portrayal of strength than any of the standard power fantasies we see in heavy metal records. Yeah, shit. I would. I, I. It would sort of be an awesome place to finish, except I've got. I've got stuff to say to that. Yeah, I no, think, go ahead. I think I can add to it. Um. Yeah. I mean, for what it's worth, I mean. Uh. uh yeah. I also. Um. I'm currently having trouble getting out of bed every day, and I've talked with the death metal guy about it, and he has mm-hmm. been helpful. You know. Uh. And it's because I accomplished too much stuff, and now I'm exhausted. <laughs> <laughs> uh. And but you know. Uh, look at me now doing abstruse heavy metal criticism on the internet. Um, no, the point more is, no, shit still sucks. Um, the point more is, uh, what the death metal guy is getting at is real. First, I mean, a couple things. First, the basic insight of the tragic worldview is that suffering is not a problem. Yeah. Or rather, in the local, of course it's a problem, right? And, you know, uh, of course, you know, we might want to prevent people suffering in various ways sure whatever it's not a metaphysical problem the fact that there is suffering in the world is not proof that the cosmos is unjust or that the world needs to be reformed or anything like that right the world is the intractable clash of forces uh you win some you lose some and that is the point Mm -hmm. right and uh in, in in the ancient world, the difference between 
epic and tragedy is just time. It's time and perspective. And that's exactly what you meant, Death Metal Guy. Um, so the scene on the cover is, and I, I looked looked this up to confirm it, it's the death of Cohelen. Uh, and Cohelen has taken so many wounds that he has to chain himself to the standing stone and face his foes technically on his feet, right, as he goes down the last time. You know, in the in the spear piercing, you can also see parallels to Odin's self-sacrifice to himself, etc. Mm-hmm. Um uh, this is I, this is <laughs> Cromlech know all of this. There, there. This is very deliberate. Um, the uh, it's and you could write um, right. I mean, we we have Cohelan from the 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 cattle raid of Ulster or the cattle raid of, uh, or the Tainbo Quailen, um, and it's a uh, that's an epic, right? It describes the death of Cohelan, but the death of Cohelan almost isn't really the tragedy part. It's like he he got absolutely what he was seeking his whole life, right? And what he had been prophesied he would get, which is an early and extremely glorious death. Mm-hmm. Uh, it, you know, he'd... Um, and in that, the focus is on the mighty deeds of Cohelan, and his death appears as another one of these mighty deeds, basically, right? Uh um, you could also write a tragedy about Cohelan, and Yeats did, right? And you can focus on the moment where, say, uh, in a moment of blindness, he he kills his son, right? And he has to, because he's a hero. He and his son are honor-bound to fight, and neither of them can yield. It would be great if they could. Cohelan kills his son, and then it breaks him, and he goes insane, and... Uh, a druid averts him from going on a rampage by sending him out to fight with the sea. <laughs> um, the uh, so and there are all sorts of other tragic moments we could focus on in his life. We could even look at his death from a tragic perspective. You could do the same thing with Achilles, right? Uh, any the, the Iliad is an epic. We could also do a tragedy of Achilles, focusing on say uh, the death of Patroclus, right? Um, or focusing on the way that Achilles sort of entertains the, authentically entertains the appeal of the joy of life and then deliberately rejects it because he's a hero, right? Um, you know, there, there's a lot of stuff you could do. Um, similarly, right? Like Oedipus, right? Mm-hmm. The thing people forget is Oedipus is also a hero. He's not just some schmo who fucked his mom, right? <laughs> it's it, 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 like... Oedipus, everything Oedipus does along the way is what a hero would do. What do you do? You run into some fucker on the road and he won't yield in his chariot. He's not going to give you his name? Who are, are you kidding me? Right? You have to kill him. Right? Okay, well, that was his dad. Uh, and then he, you know, he he goes to Thebes, right? They, they crown him king. What do you do? Well, you marry the queen. That's what you do. You're a hero. Why wouldn't you? Well, it turns out that's his mom. And everything he's done up to that point isn't deliberate attempt to avoid that entire fate, right? <laughs> right? <laughs> the So he conducts himself exactly as he should, which is as an outrageously prideful and aggressive man. And that's the idea of hubris. People do not understand hubris. They always, it's, it's taught as this, as you say, this sort of Protestant Christian morality play. Pride cometh before very, the fall. Very, very negativistic, very yes. anti-life. Yes. Yes, he had a, but the hero had a tragic flaw. Um, the heroes act in only one way, which is as heroes, and with outrageous pride and will. And it means they do great deeds, and that they also s- suffer greatly and have boundary problems. That is, like, they do, <laughs> they do things that even by the sort of amoral ethical code of an iron heroic age are either really bad or very suboptimal, right? <laughs> um, or extremely unwise. Um, so, you know, uh, Jason's tragedy in some way is that uh, he he does exactly what a king would do, which is ditch his concubine and marry the, uh, the hot young blonde princess, right? Um, we're not Jason, sorry. Uh, blah, 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 Theseus. Mm-hmm. Um, uh, and... 
Wait, no, I'm, I'm fucking my tragedies up. Uh, <laughs> I'm trying to do the Medea, right? J- it's Jason and Medea. Um, yes. Uh, uh, and and he, you know, he, he, he becomes a king, but he has, in doing so, he has accepted the path to kingship. He has done the political thing and the heroic thing, but in so doing, he's betrayed a lover, right? And mm-hmm. betrayed a lover, not in... And in a way that ultimately costs him terribly. Uh, or, you know, we, we can run this with any of the ancient Greeks, mm-hmm. right? It's just the difference is not... Epic and tragedy are two ways of looking at the life of a hero. And hubris is essential to a hero. It is not a flaw. It's what makes him. And it is also what undoes him, whether that is in the moment or at the end, right? Uh, and... Cromlech very clearly embrace their own hubris on this, right? Holding your heart, where the blackest you 
All right, we are back with our next review of the night. Yeah, we actually have another album to talk about, guys, after that that fucking monolithic piece we just did. Um, But it's kind of cool because we get to talk about another record that is very ambitious in its own right, albeit with a very different set of ingredients. Uh, This is the debut record by Hacks Process titled The Caverns of Duat, uh, which is an independent release on Bandcamp and now has a CD distribution deal with Witch's Brew. Um, so uh, up front, these are guys that I know. Uh, this is a three-piece, and the two guitarists of the band are uh, guys that I hang out with at shows a lot because this is a band out of Jacksonville. Uh, we're not super close uh, just because of the distance, but pretty much every time we run into each other, we talk about music for a while. Uh, good guys yeah. to talk about art with. Um so Hacks Process is a 90s style progressive or technical death metal band, which is uh, might sound like a, an overly specific distinction, but I think we can say at this point that what you call tech death now has vanishingly little to do with what we would have called tech death back in the 90s. Mm-hmm. Um So this is a record that is not quite within the old school style. This really strikes me as stuff that you would hear circa 98 or 99. You know, it's rocky territory for death metal as a genre where a lot of people were trying to feel out the contours of the future of the style. Um, But that seems to be what Hacks Process is really invested in. Uh, So Hacks Process is also an example of uh, a type of metalhead that we're seeing more and more, which is the Zoomer in a Time Ghoul shirt. Uh, And that that description doesn't tell you that much up front, but it usually goes a couple different ways. Uh, On one hand, you've got its proto-record collector nerd shit, and, you know, they'll be really into... I don't know, indie rock by the time they're 25. They don't matter. And, um, and that one band from Colorado. Yeah, yeah, that one band from Colorado that doesn't matter. Um, <laughs> and uh, But the uh, the other one, uh, the Zoomer in a Time Ghoul t-shirt, is actually a really serious musician. And uh, one of the guys in this band, Lothar, who is the, as far as I can tell, the primary songwriter. Such a cool name. That dude is a fucking Visigoth prince. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> it's pretty cool. Um, but, uh, yeah, so he's 19 years old. He's really into Time Ghoul, and he's a pretty phenomenal guitarist and songwriter. Um, so what makes this interesting, we talk about this a lot on the show, the idea of people getting into metal at different eras, what they're listening to based on the time period that they're getting into it. Um, and recently, over the last few years, we've seen a resurgence of appreciation for Time Ghoul and Demi Lich and a whole slew of weird 90s death metal that were, these were like cult favorites back in the 2000s people talked about. Then discussion kind of died off, and now it's coming back with a new generation of uh, metalheads and musicians. Uh, this album is definitely cut from that sort of cloth. Um, It is a 90s death metal record in execution and production. But what it really sounds like is the the sort of leading edge of progressive death metal at that time that would sort of bear out into modern tech death. I'm talking about like the uh, the first couple psychroptic records, Anada, uh, which is a band we both really enjoy. Some of the Finnish death metal stuff, some of the weirder progier stuff there and uh for a left field one for people who are interested in this kind of thing, there was a really, really underrated and basically forgotten band called Burning Inside that just did a couple records that were really cool in 90s tech death. So all the emphasis on this record is sort of based around reconstructing an established style, but it's not the kind of style that people really imitate unless they're really invested in very specific details about that kind of music because it is difficult and weird, kind of approachable just in the sense that it's not focused on brutality, but definitely long haired and definitely demanding of the listener's attention. Um, And I got to say, you know, I originally heard these guys first when I saw them live as a three piece, two guitars, uh, drums, no bassist. And I was completely fucking blown away. Uh, not only by how tight and intricate these guys were on their respective instruments, but because of the very 
very clear and defined songwriting, even on very expen- expansive 10 minute plus tracks. So really, we're going to be talking about a lot of the same features we were talking about on our last review. But real quick, I want to kick it to you. Uh, what did you make of this, uh, especially knowing that this is not the kind of scene that you've really been exposed to much before? Yeah, this is far outside my wheelhouse. So, you know, I'm uh, I, I'm letting you take the lead here. Um, and I approach it with a kind of bracketing, right? Mm-hmm. You know, um, <clears throat> like, um, this is... Um, the first time I listened to it, I hated it. Um, just straight up hated it. And then the second time I listened to it tonight, I listened to it with some more focus. Uh, my my mind was sharpened from uh, meditating on Cromlech all day. Um, <laughs> and uh, I, I liked it. I, I, I thought it was... I, and, and I think I like... Given that it's really not my thing, it's good that I could just say I liked it. Um, and... You know, I think it is, as far as I can tell, it's really quite well done for the style uh, and sort of distinctive. I definitely hear what you mean by psychroptic, mm-hmm. um, where the emphasis is not on brutality. Uh, psychroptic's riffs, I think, are a lot more abrasive or aggressive or something, although not in a brutal way. Mm-hmm. Uh, um, Anata, I, I, I didn't, the Anata thing kind of makes sense now that I've listened again to some of the melodies. I feel like, especially on the last track, I hear that. But Anata's pretty intense, right? It's it, Yeah, but I guess I was thinking more in the sense that Anata does a lot of these sort of ornate almost pointillistic mid-paced passages. Yeah, okay. And structurally, and that sort of structurally, quote-unquote, straightforward, riff-based, 4-4-3-4, but with very ornate riffing, uh, and things like that, right? Is that fair? Yeah, Um, yeah. Uh, Anata would play with time signatures um, a little bit more, but the general sound is is what I'm going for. Um, now, the the real difference, I guess, that I'm trying to get at if, between this and uh, Psychroptic and Anata and this is that this band sounds chill. Yeah, it is very weirdly chill music, isn't it? Not in a not in a flabby or inert way, and not in the sort of n- noodly floating nonsense way that I, you know I hate about certain of the core tech death bands. Um, uh, and there's plenty of intensity here in given passages. Um, it is intensely chill, let's say, <laughs> right? It ha- it has that in common with um, uh, uh, the band from Colorado that's good. Oh, Astral Tomb. Yes, Astral Tomb. Um, the uh, a- so Astral Tomb is a lot louder, but both are intensely chill, um, mm-hmm. and you could definitely see them on a bill together. Um, uh. Uh, what else? I mean, I think um, as far as stuff that sounds like Santana, I would say <laughs> this is the apex because they're doing it on purpose, right? Usually, sounding like Santana is a sign that, oops, you picked the wrong minor scale. Right? Yeah, yeah. Or, or, oops, you played it with the wrong inflection. Uh, or, oh, that guitar solo went on a little too long. In this case, it's quite. I think it's quite deliberate. I don't know if they're influenced by Santana, but he's just in the background for a lot of stuff they're doing. Uh, and, you know, the kind of sensuous, jammy, kind of Latin noodling meshes well with the core of this music, which is these Phrygian or Egyptian-sounding riffs that skitter all over the place, right? Mm-hmm. Yeah, um, this, it's interesting because this is a record that is primarily to a large extent composed out of uh, Phrygian phrasing, but I actually like it a lot. Oh uh, yeah, that's the thing I was going to say. I really didn't like it when I first heard it, but when I listen to it second, I'm like, this doesn't, yeah, so primarily Phrygian, we mean just the Snake Charmer scale. Mm-hmm. Right? Um, and the stuff that accidentally leads to Snake Charmer music a lot. Usually the way to avoid that is to be really, really fucking loud. Right. Yeah. <laughs> so Nile uh, or Malakash or, I mean, even to a certain extent, Marduk, right? Mm-hmm. Um, you know, the uh, thrash metal minor is pretty close, right? Uh, it, it can work with bands that are extremely aggressive and that emphasize the most dissonant intervals in those scales or th- spice them up with chromatics. Um, 
in this case, they really are just Phrygian scales, and they're not being delivered aggressively at all. And yet this band makes it work. Uh, it doesn't really get monotonous or harmonically thin, and it doesn't sound like a cliched, watered-down version of Eastern culture. Um, yeah. It's not really trying to sound... It's ev- It deals with Egyptian themes, but it's not trying to sound like Egyptian music and certainly not Middle Eastern. Yeah, I think this... Um... I, I, I think this whole conceit works because, you know, another connection to the previous review, uh, this really is taking a lot in from 70s prog rock mm-hmm. in, in a very direct sense. Um, mm-hmm. I mean, this whole wing of technical death metal in the 90s was definitely looking outside of metal for a lot mm-hmm. of primary inspirations. Um I would I would throw this in the same wheelhouse as something like Atheist, though I don't think that's really a direct influence. And that Atheist was very interested in jazz and world music and stuff like that, so Cynic would also be a parallel here. Um, for these guys, I think it's mostly all coming from within death metal and heavy metal and some of that 70s prog stuff. But I think one of the reasons the Phrygian stuff lands more is just because the reason Phrygian doesn't work in a lot of death metal is that death metal is supposed to sound extremely ferocious and aggressive. And I just don't think it's a scale that's great at sounding that way. But yeah. when the intent is to make something that's, you know, death metal, it's heavy, but it's more spacey and introspective yeah. and progressive. Yeah. That makes a lot more sense. That's a very good way of putting it. Yeah. It like fits with the Santana vibe. Mm-hmm. Uh, yeah, in a way, a Phrygian scale was a primitive way of ge- generating a certain kind of dissonance or darkness mm-hmm. in if you were a hard rock band or a prog band or a uh, early thrash band, right? And then that got changed rapidly by the innovations in the most aggressive thrash, death black metal. Um, here, yeah, it's just being used more in this kind of jammy, loose way. And the good thing is the main risk is it getting too texturally samey. Mm-hmm. Um, but it doesn't ever really run into that in part because there's great melodic inventiveness. Oh yeah. Often Phrygian stuff lacks any harmonic depth, right? Mm-hmm. It's very monophonic, very focused on the main melodic line. And there's not, I don't know, in part because it's kind of like modal, right? It works. It's more drone based. One reason it's cool and gets close to heavy extreme metal riffing is it's more drone based, root note centered, Right, But that means I feel like it's not an intuitive thing to write harmony with for a lot of people. Mm -hmm. These guys are really good at harmonizing. uh, And uh, not just in layering, but also just in very cool chord progression-y things happening within the riffs. Yeah. uh, The... I mean, kind of the central voice on this record are those twin lead guitar lines Mm -hmm. that just litter the whole album. And... uh, I'm the kind of guy where a ton of, you know, harmonic lead guitars or just a lot of noodling can rapidly wear out its welcome. But these guys are versatile enough as musicians that they can constantly spin up new takes uh, on this central Phrygian idea. Um, also, just as an aside, but I think it's very descriptive. When I saw these guys live, uh, the drummer has roto toms. And the two guitarists at one point played with ebos, so you know what kind of band this is immediately. What, what is a roto tom? Oh, a roto tom is a a a throwback style of tom on a drum kit. It was especially popular in the '80s, and I believe that the distinguishing feature is that they are designed to be tuned to specific notes, so you can get mm. a sort of melodic effect out of oh. roto tom arrangements. That's very Santana. Yeah, it is. But, it, but it's like you see those things on stage, and you're like, "Oh, okay, so we're we're in the '70s now." You know? Yeah, yeah, yeah. No, that that makes sense. That yeah. for sure makes sense. I mean, yeah. What I would say is like this is one of those records where certain part in certain parts, my brain turns off and my eyes glaze over. But like, that's kind of what's supposed to happen during those parts. Um, even if you're a hardcore fan, because that's the part where you're like stoned and you space out. Yeah. And <laughs> n- not being a hardcore fan, uh, I, it's easy for me to accept. Right? Yeah, I got you. No, yeah. that's fair. And, uh, and yeah. that's actually a good way to lead us into the first sample. Um, so I'm going to play a sample off the, f- I, I guess you could go, this is a, uh, 
it's a five track album that's 45 minutes long and uh it's dominated by two epics and i want to uh play a sample off the first one titled at one with time so these are elaborate sort of sweet like song structures across a lot of this record um it's describing this with the the prog death or the tech death tag is interesting just because that's changed so much. And here it really means that the arrangements and individual sections are demanding and technical and dense. But most of this music, kind of like you suggested before, is four bars of this, four bars of that, generally operating in common time or three, four. Um, So here I want to get into the real meat of the music. Uh, a lot of these songs are built around almost sound objecty things, you know, maybe uh, a, a weird spacey guitar lead or some distinct figure. Mm-hmm. But for this section of At One With Time, I want to explore the the generative material between two big peaks in the song, uh, where we're going to see more of the sort of bread and butter prog death riffing that these guys are so good at. And let's just pay attention to the way this song digresses very deliberately and finds its way back to the narrative center. So after that section, they sit on that riff for a while, but just keep decreasing in tempo, you know, sort of a a forced climax, but it really works. Um, So a couple things that I want to point out. One, uh, I really love, uh, so we begin at the end of the first climax of the song, and then we've got these more workmanlike, more traditionally death metal riffs building tension and moving us toward this next climax at the end of this sample. And all of those riffs in between the quote-unquote big moments feel very essential and are very cool on both a technical and songwriting level. I really like that uh, convulsive little which is a such a distinctly late 90s death metal sort of figure um but it's just it's the kind of idiomatic or if you don't typically hear in prog or tech death these days um 
we've often talked on the show about how tech death is really better seen as the successor to thrash metal than a branch of death metal. And that's kind of true here because a lot of the meat and potatoes riffing on this is derived from thrash forms, but with a much more active left hand. And I think that's really cool. Those are not the kind of riffs that I can write naturally. So it's really interesting to see guys who are so good at spinning out tons of them across the record. Um, yeah, well, earlier tonight we were talking about, before the show started, you and I were talking about suffocation riffs, right? And mm-hmm. how those were these, one of the first to do these kinds of, like, rolling, tight, eighth or sixteenth note runs just as the riff. And how when you you were a teenager, that wasn't really your thing. Uh, mm-hmm. That, uh, uh, what I love is that after the sort of most digressive section, they immediately dial it back in with that, yeah. Um, or something more complicated than that that I can't hum. Uh, and that's like a good sort of missing link between suffocation and thrash, really. Uh, yeah, yeah. And and it is, it's not loud. It's not delivered. It's not delivered aggressively. It just is intense and heavy. Yeah, yeah. It's, it, yeah. it's very naturalistic, it's, uh, which is mm-hmm. one of the things I really and, like about this record. And there's a cool contraction in the musical time there, right? You get the more sort of, you, you get the scale runs, and then suddenly everything's sort of like tightened down to the sort of uh, trilling chug. Yeah, it's a, it's very tight, and it never feels artificial. You the, these feel very. Uh, I I don't know what the recording setup was, but this feels very live played, which may or may not mm-hmm. be true, but metal should pretty much always feel Mm -hmm. like it's being played live. Mm -hmm. Uh, I also want to mention just, you know, so I don't forget it when we're talking about melodic and harmonic ideas, the drumming across this record is phenomenal. And again, extremely period appropriate in that it reflects an era where guys who really cut their teeth playing thrash and death metal very consciously started reaching out to um, jazz and Latin music to create variation. So there's a lot of really nice groove work without a lot of flash. It's uh, drum patterns you have to really hone in on and think about to realize, oh, these are actually very difficult. Um, but in the context of the music, they feel very confident and very natural and very laid back. Um And the other thing I like is sort of uh, talking about both those aspects at once. There's a certain rehearsal room atmosphere to this album Mm -hmm. in that, yeah, they're capable of doing high contrast parts and they're capable of delivering a lot of riffs per minute. But there's also a lot of sections of this album where they just sit back on a single motif for a couple minutes. They're in the groove. They're playing with the contours of it. But it's all pretty much the same idea which you basically just categorically won't hear in modern progressive or technical death metal because they see that as like, well, you know, I could fit another 20 riffs here, so why wouldn't I? (laughs) Mm -hmm. (laughs) Uh, So, yeah, um, other thing that I was thinking as, well, almost as that sample started, and you got that, Mm -hmm. was that there are some very... uh, side scroller video game feel about this record yeah yeah um not in the uh my girlfriend has this way of saying a certain melody sounds like the egyptian level or the (laughs) under (laughs) that's good that's good yeah this record is very the egyptian (laughs) level but not in a snake charmer cliche way uh and it also goes to the cover too which is uh I mean, we were talking on the, before the show about how awesome it is. It's the cover is hilarious, but also really dark. Yeah, yeah, it's yeah. it's cool. You're you're getting guys getting his soul ripped out of him to move on to the afterlife, but you've got the the contrails leading back to the body. It's very '90s comic book. You know, it's really cool. Yeah, it's like yeah, it's it's this. It has the great literalism of myth, where it's like the 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 body somehow traverses to the gates of the underworld, and then it's like. You take one, you step one hex too far, bam, you're dead, <laughs> right? Like well, one, one, one pixel too far, you're, you're, uh, you're dead. Your body flees into hell. His body is moving out of him so, or his soul is moving out of him so fast. Like it's just, um, it's very cool. And the background has an awesome sea graviness to it. Mm-hmm. Uh, um, like it's actually a beautiful and on 
environment. And there's also cool perspective shit where, like, the figures in the cavern are deliberately flattened like Egyptian art. Mm -hmm. um, yeah, it's, it's just a very cool cover. And the way that it is extremely disturbing and hilarious captures this, I think, uh, playful approach to music. Yeah, definitely. Mm -hmm. Yeah. And, oh, yeah. And I guess the the whole missing link there was that like the cover looks at least the main two figures on the cover look very video gamey. Right? Yeah. So, yeah. Yeah. Um, yeah. The uh, I guess I sort of said that. Okay. We're on to uh, my first sample, which is uh, from the Infinity Paradox. Okay. Uh, Prog death nerds hate them. This one trick makes your riff sound like bulldozers. sick um <laughs> it's okay i almost sampled that like this exact part <laughs> yeah you just you knew i would get it right yeah 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 dude yeah it's, it's yeah <laughs> it's, it's um uh so when you hear the first riff it sounds like a sort of very deliberately laid back sort of jazzy version of the pantera riff mm -hmm. it's it's still heavy but it's sort of, the, the initial way they're delivering it is very, like, loose syncopation, light touch on the guitar. Things that you'd expect to be power chords or mutes are textured. Uh, mm -hmm. And they've got a little more, um, obviously there's more complexity, right? More death metal-y sort of uh, complexity. And there's a lead that starts the phrase. Or a, or a chord, a tremolo chord run that starts the phrase that's more complex. You also said it sounds like one of the weirder Morbid Angel riffs, right? Yeah, it sounds almost like stuff you'd hear on an album like Heretic, uh, which you'd similar kind of like weird suspended right. chords. Right. So you hear that and you're like, is that a Pantera riff? And then the entire rest of the track exists to tell you, yes, and it was fucking <laughs> intentional. Um, right? The next riff drops and it's just... 
they've done this they've done the thing where they give you sort of jazzy prog death pantera and just play a pantera riff uh you know uh the the we both love the downbeat cymbal drums and you know uh the tattoo 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 yeah yeah um, yeah uh it's um the riff is killer and it's delivered much more uh it's much more centered and punchy, right? That just sounds like a Pantera riff mm-hmm. uh, and fully bulldozers. Um, and then you think, and then they develop it in a cool way, right? They do that that stutter time thing with the new metal bassist dance, <laughs> right? Cool kind of like, I think, octaves going over that melodically. But on the other hand, underneath it, there is a turn or the same turnaround that's in the chug riff, but mm-hmm. that's delivered faster. Um, and then they just play the chug riff again. <laughs> yeah. This is pure commitment in, in this song, right? Uh, they, and then finally, um, you get to the solo and in case you thought they were still joking, they're not right. Then he plays a dime bag <laughs> solo, uh, <laughs> And um, you can see, hopefully, his tongue swinging from side to side, right? Uh, it's, um, or the, but the cool thing is, and this is a parallel to Cromwell, uh mm-hmm. it's written in a very old heavy metal thing, like in the way that like a uh, Diamond Head or an Angel Witch would write solos, in that the solo's anchored by a real riff. Yes. Um, and keeps pushing off it. So the thing that initially sounds like the solo is actually just him ripping a huge riff that gets transferred to power chord and becomes the bass for the solo. Yeah, there's um, a there's a cool head fake that happens yeah. there. It's like you think yeah. it's starting with the solo. No, no, no. This is yeah. the actual riff. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> and then that becomes the riff. And then he flies off on the solo. And at the turnaround of the riff, the solo meets up with it, strikes down on it, and lifts off. Mm. It never actually plays the turnaround, but he's doing cool phrases in parallel to it. Uh, like, you know, uh, more of that po- polyphonic thing that you hear Cromwell pursuing, right? Mm-hmm. Um, and there are some great solos on that record that work like this. Uh, um, well, I, I really like what you said about, you know, the way this relates to having a younger guy spearheading it. I think that's like a really salient point. Oh yeah. I forgot to make that point. So there was actually so much there structurally that I, I forgot to get to that. So this band really benefits from uh, something that is uh, for the most part, a negative, which is the way that zoomers have canonized nineties corporate metal. Mm-hmm. Um, so like, uh, um, you know the the very obvious downside is the, the that somehow bargain basement just total bottom feeder Molgoth culture is now like hip, right? Yeah. Uh, the plus side, right, is that people no longer have artificial stigmas against certain types of heaviness that were considered too ignorant or mm. too mainstream, right? And so we get uh, people listening to Pantera seriously. Um, and incorporating it, right? Now, no prog death guy in the late 90s or early 2000s would have fucking dreamed of that. Uh, They would have utter contempt for that. Um, However, right, uh, in the early 90s, as, you know, uh, you've pointed out, right, there was not such a hard and fast division there. Death metal bands toured with Pantera when they were trying to break death metal, and, uh, you know, I mean, you've, you, I, I, they're in the, you know, this is a very much a Florida death metal band. They're a Southern band. Mm-hmm. Uh, and it makes sense, the intersection. And there are, would it be right to say there are like, there's Florida death metal from the nineties that actually sounds like Pantera? Yeah, I would say so. I mean, I, mm-hmm. I think, I, I mean, mid-era obituary sounds like Pantera. Mm-hmm. Um, Pantera is a big deal anywhere in the South, and Florida was not alone in that. And especially because there's that extra tie where Morbid Angel and Pantera did a very important tour together in the uh. early 90s. Mm-hmm. Um, people also, um, we, we were talking about this a little bit before the show, how people kind of misplace things in their mind uh, when it comes mm-hmm. to the timeline of record releases. Mm-hmm. 
Cowboys from Hell was released in 1990. Which seems crazy because you think of Pantera as like a mid to late '90s band, but that's yeah, not, that's actually not correct. They they were really growing in parallel with death metal. Um, it's the opposite of Hatebreed. Yeah, 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 yeah. Uh, yeah, yeah. Um, <laughs> you think Hatebreed's much earlier, but it's well, not. yeah, yeah, exactly, yeah. yeah. Um, yeah, so so really, what these guys in Hacks process are doing is again, this speaks to the authenticity of its uh, attempted sound. Which is that it's taken some of these disparate influences, you would call them, actually are not disparate at all for the time period that this is oriented around. Mm-hmm. Um, Pantera would definitely be a thing. This is the period where people start experimenting with jazz and stuff a lot more, as well as a lot of these sort of uh, Latin sounding rhythms that dot the record. Um, all of this is contiguous. Like, they, it's not just that they took the style of prog death, but they took all the influences those bands were also taking in. And really taking advantage of this sort of confused period where no one was really sure what the future of death metal was. Yeah, and a commonality, right, would be that uh, bands like Pantera um, were uh, interested in rhythm in a way that many of the proggy or death metal bands were, and that many of the more down-the-line death metal bands were not. Mm-hmm. Now, Pantera was interested in rhythm in a very straightforward, simple way, right? Chop it up, syncopate it to make it crushing, right? Mm-hmm. Bulldozer sound, right? It, principle-wise, not different from classic hardcore songwriting or, you know, Slayer or whatever. But, the, um, but uh, you know, very different in how it ultimately sounded. Um, and so that, that emphasis on the percussive, rhythmic quality of the music is something that, in a roundabout way, it has in common with stuff that aspires to... Uh, say, complex rolling tonal drums. Mm-hmm. Yeah, no, I, I definitely agree. Um, so let me get to another sample um, where I'll, I'll make good on my promise of uh, talking about the more sound objecty stuff. Also, wait, quick thing to maybe table, maybe not digress here, but mm-hmm. uh, maybe bring up at another point or at the end, just digression. Do you think the label, entire label groove metal is stupid and unfair? Uh, I, I I do, and I think that it's like it's for relatively simple reasons. Just because, yeah, yeah, yeah. I always really like the label post thrash uh, or half thrash. Yeah, because really, yeah. when you get down to it, most groove metal is just slowed down versions of rhythmic structures that were already present in the yeah, thrash. Yeah, yeah. If you speed up most of these groove metal records, the, the, those riffs just turn into thrash riffs. I mean, thrash yeah. riffs were always built around, yeah. for the most part, palm-muted open E configurations yeah. with melodic features dotting the, that yeah. that rhythmic bedrock. Um, and you'll hear that a lot in groove metal. It's just played slower. Yeah, and any groove metal that doesn't fit that classification is either grunge or butt rock. Yeah, exactly. There you go. It only yeah. it, it walks a tightrope and it falls off on either side of that chasm. Um, <laughs> exactly. All right. <laughs> All right. So so now I'll talk about a uh, phantasm. So the the sort of Santana quality that you pointed out really bears out here. Um, in that this is a very exploratory kind of jammy song that keeps threatening to push in a more distinctly death metal direction, but never really does, Um, which just from description might sound dissatisfying, but it's actually just really curious and exploratory and fun. Like, the band knows what they're doing. They're they're teasing you with a, a climax that does arrive eventually, but not in the form that you expected. Uh... So let's, uh, let's go into this one. This is coming off the tail end of a, a clean guitar intro, and let's just see what happens.
so I, I I've got a real appreciation for um head fake songwriting tricks like this um because what hacks process does here is they do a, a funny thing where they take what would be sort of like intro fodder for another death metal band and they decide to really commit to the idea and treat it like it's a serious part of the music um, this song opens with a, a really cool, agile, uh, kind of techy riff that reminds you of Psychoptic, but it pretty quickly uh, bails out into that extended atmospheric bass-driven section. And they treat that like a serious part of the song. And then when the electric guitars really kick in the distortion, they're committing to that same melody and they iterate mm-hmm. on it. Everything follows from that. Um, I always go back to uh, that one review of the Cephalotripsy record that I really like, where uh, you know Syncline on Rate Your Music talks about how there's an incredible moment when you listen to that album and you realize, oh no, this is what it's going to be. All of this material is going to be this lattice work of breakdowns. You know? mm-hmm. And something similar happens here, where you think that this is going to go into a more regular death thrash kind of direction, yeah. but it never does. It commits to the bespoke weirdness of the idea of the song, and I really appreciate that. You know, also, deg- sort of callback... That's before the show. I talked about the Cromlech record as sounding like it's made entirely of bridges, mm-hmm. or we sort of we both did. And you agree that was a decent characterization to me, right? That sounds like it never quite ends up anywhere. But to you, maybe it's kind of like the lattice work of Slams thing, mm-hmm. right? Yeah, where it's just it isn't even though for Cromlech it's all made of every different kind of thing. In a sense, it's all made of one thing. Yeah, right? yeah, 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 and it's and it's all made of a part of the song that you would expect to be less important. Yeah, and uh, there's a very similar conceit operating on this record mm-hmm. as well. Yeah, yeah, no, I, I hear that. I think, um, I think it, uh, this is so far from my wheelhouse that I'm, you know, like, uh, um, that parts that you know, in music I was more invested in that I might find excessive or whatever. Here I just take for granted as part Oh, yeah. Of the style. No, this is definitely yeah. one of those glaze-over parts you were talking yeah, about. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I expect, I expect this stuff to, to sort of, uh, to just go for it in that respect. Or, uh, and, and to be deliberately sort of indulgent. Um, mm-hmm. and, well, I also like the way it's, it's designed in an almost backwards way, where, you know, you get that big, almost doom-death riff, which I think is sort of a riff on... Una Slayer of the Gods, which is one of Nile's mm-hmm. older epics. It was off their third album, I think. Mm-hmm. Um, I like how there's no preparation for that big, slow chug riff. You know, mm-hmm. that that sort of feels like it should come at the end of the song, but it doesn't. And I like that further inversion of expectations. Yeah, this is a strong track in general. I remember, I don't have any definite ideas about it, except I remember it being strong and the... Yeah, like, also, another thing pointing out is that I didn't even realize there were cleans during that part. They sound good, in part because they're muted. (laughs) This allows me to talk about the vocals more generally. Um, Apparently, the vocals vocals are done by the youngest guy in the band, right? By Mm -hmm. Lothar, right? Yeah. He sounds like he's forty five. Yeah, <laughs> like yeah, he he's sounds like really he's a voice. he's a skinny skinny teenager. He sounds like he's a forty five year old with a barrel chest. Uh, the vocals aren't forward in the mix, but they are extremely brutal. Yeah, they're actually like almost uh, more grunty. It's like almost old Chris Barnes Cannibal Corpse style, which is kind of weird for. Like, this style of music, you'd expect that more sort of mid-high, fry-screamy mm-hmm. mm-hmm. thing yes. that you'll hear in Psychoptic and stuff. But I like the commitment to that more oh. guttural style. Yeah, and the way that he makes it work with stuff like this is that it's it's back, as you say, it's far back in the mix and it's not used that much. And so when it hits, it's a cool percussive punctuation mark. Yeah. Uh, and yeah, and he, do, he does them live while playing guitar, which is extra impressive. <laughs> Yeah, I I can't believe there was a time when I thought I would have a band and do that. Um, <laughs> yeah. You can do it. It's just it's a pain in the ass. That's all. <laughs> yeah, you know. I mean, I think I, I think it only got to the it that band never got never got finished. But I think I was uh, gonna have to rely on the uh, yell when the part changes technique. <laughs> it's it's um, worked for many years for many bands. Yeah, <laughs> yell at the start of the measure. 
<laughs> Half note. <laughs> um, anyway, uh, let's let's go to Caverns of Duat, the title track. So, the interesting thing, uh, and I think I, I respect a lot about this band, is that, like, two-thirds of the way through, right, um, about half an hour through a 45-minute record, uh, they start their last, sprawling last track. That's one thing they have in common with Cromluck. This is 14 minutes long. Um... And when they do that, they pull out a totally different harmonic language. Um, it's not just the Phrygian and Latin stuff. Suddenly we get epic Dorian melodies uh, in the vein of, uh, you know, heavy metal, black metal, melodic death metal, all sorts of stuff. But they're always delivered with tandem guitars in the vein of Thin Lizzy and Maiden. Also very much like Cromlech, right? Mm -hmm. Maybe tandem guitar is having a comeback as more than just like candy and pop heavy heavy songs, right? No, um, I've noticed that too. Yeah. I, I like that people are yeah. doing more yeah. with dual guitars yeah. in a really yeah. extreme heavy metal way. And, and a lot of the Swedish Black Death um, actually kind of depends on dueling guitars. Just they're both playing chords, mm -hmm. um, which is a thing that I think has been sort of forgotten. That's one reason it became... Nobody could imitate it. First. That's one reason it got turned into Satanic Warmaster, basically. Uh, but, like, so there was a whole vocabulary of sort of high 90s extreme metal that actually kind of depended on Lizzie Maiden methods. <laughs> uh, and this really reclaims that. Um, and it's played, the, the, the tandem harmonies are played with tensor harmonies that preserve their link to death metal. It's not just some random heavy metal shit happening in the song. Uh, and really kind of sound like the disharmonies in Sentenced, um, in, you know, North From Here. So, uh, and from there they spin out into a long jam section, whatever, whatever. But when they do dial it back in, they do it really decisively. Uh, and, um, uh, also worth noting is that you could hear the maidenish vibe even in the riff they use to restart the song, which is, uh... It's like they wrote an atonal riff in parallel to an Iron Maiden folk run. Last riff is so fucking cool. Oh, isn't that sick? That's awesome. Oh. It's it's such a, a strange figure. It like that's one of those one of those melodic arrangements that like pulls at your memory. It, mm -hmm. It's like it, it makes you think it's something you've heard before, like recontextualized Maiden or something. But mm -hmm. it's not. It's a, it's an entirely new thing. It just, but it also sounds classic. 
Yeah. Right. I mean, yeah. I think that one it's... thing that we're seeing over the past couple of years, mm-hmm. especially doing the show, is just death metal rediscovering heavy metal in important ways. Yeah. So basically, um, you can hear they so they do that more dissonant run. You were also comparing it to possessed, right? Really early death metal phrasing. Mm-hmm. And then we're actually back in the Dorian feel, but again, with these really tense harmonies that kind of link it to the feel of the earlier Dorian stuff. Um, and eventually they get into what they sort of release in a uh, more drawn out bending riff that could just be on Slaughter of the Soul. Like, it's very similar to one song. I can't remember which. Um, and uh, not in a bad way, right? And, and then when that finally, that last ripping riff comes in, it's rhythmically timed out, kind of like the 6-8 stuff on literally the title track of Slaughter of the Soul. But um, but again, yeah, got a very cool thing where although it has the epic consonants that we'd expect of something like that, it's also harmonized in a way that really darkens it. Uh, they keep repeating it after the sample ends, which is probably a hallmark of that, you know, 90s prog death stuff that mm-hmm. is a little more formally conservative and thrashy. But, like, in this case, right, I think it just, you know, that's just to the good, right? 